What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and I am very excited, guys, to announce my one year on YouTube. Now, I thought in honor and uh, in celebration of that one year mark here on YouTube, I would bring to you guys a collaboration of every single video that I have made throughout this entire year. Now, this is excluding the live streams, of course. Um, there are way too many of those account, but every single one of my weekly uploads is on this video, guys. It's going to be super amazing, and we are calling it Outlaw Bits Gaming Season 1. Hoping to make this a yearly tradition, guys. So if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Can't thank you guys enough for watching, and without any further ado, let's get right into it. How's it going guys? Your bearded boy wonder here, Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming. And today, I wanted to show you the top 10 rarest games for one of my favorite systems of all time. That's right guys, to the Nintendo 64. So without further ado, let's get right into it. guys today we're going to be working on my Star Fox I uh, bought it from the exchange in this pin The Nintendo 64 was released on June 23rd, 1996, and with it, a new era of video games was set to unfold. With amazing graphics, unforgettable gameplay, and a full arsenal of heavy hitters like Mario and Donkey Kong to lead the pack, Nintendo was about to sweep the gaming industry by storm, making the N64 a must-have for every 90s kid's TV stand. As we get further into 2019, and closer to that 25th anniversary mark for the system, Demand and popularity of the nostalgic video game console continues to skyrocket, causing prices of the once reasonably valued cartridges to steadily increase, projecting some of the more obscure titles into extreme rarity. Today, we're going to be tackling the top rarest games sought after by collectors and some of the hardest to obtain for the Nintendo 64 console. No point in wasting time, guys. Let's get right into it. The first game on our list, coming in at the number 10 spot, is Bomberman 64, The Second Attack. Coming to the N64 on May 28, 2000, Bomberman 64 The Second Attack failed to impress audiences with its lackluster soundtrack and seemingly identical graphics to the first installment of the series, Bomberman 64. Pairing that with similar gameplay mechanics and pairingly low sales, the Bomberman 64 The Second Attack had a relatively low shelf life being replaced by more prominent Nintendo titles on the store shelves. These factors played a role in earning Bomberman 64 The Second Attack our number 10 spot for the rarest N64 games of all time. With increased demand from collectors as of recent years, you can get your copy today on eBay or out in the wild, if you're lucky, for around $200 US. Happy hunting, folks. Coming in at number 9 on our list is an interesting twist on tactics games and turn-based RPGs alike. Falling in at number 9 is Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber. Ogre Battle 64 is a strategy-based GRPG released on October 7, 2000, and was developed by Quest and published by Atlas Games. And if you know anything about Atlas Games, they've been known since the NES days for printing their games in such small numbers that some could argue that every Atlas game eventually becomes a limited edition. 
earning them the spots in countless rare games lists across the board. While well received in Japan, Western audiences weren't as thrilled about JRPGs of the time, thus bringing Ogre Battle 64 further into obscurity and earning its spot at the number 9 rarest N64 game on our list. You can pick up your copy today on eBay or at your local game store for around 50 bucks US making this game one of the easiest to obtain for your collection on our list. Coming in hot at number 8 is StarCraft 64. StarCraft 64 is a real-time strategy game released on June 13, 2000. Developed by Blizzard originally as a widely successful PC game, Nintendo sought to turn the pinnacle of the computer gaming market into a cartridge port for the Nintendo 64 system. While the goal was noble, the game wasn't well received by audiences or critics acclaim, due to its finicky controls that didn't feel quite right in the Nintendo 64's joystick and button layouts. Players wanted to experience the intense real-time strategy game with the common computer mouse that they were used to, and that was something that Nintendo simply couldn't deliver. Sending this title off the store shelves and into the 8th spot on our list for the most rare N64 games. You can snag your copy of StarCraft online today for around 50 bucks US. Not bad. Coming in at a solid number 7 on our list is Mario Party 3. Mario Party 3 was released in the U.S. on May 7, 2001, which was undoubtedly towards the end of the N64's time span on the market. This fact led to low production numbers of the game and decreased sales despite adding a plethora of new exciting features and over 70 new minigames to play. Due to the impending release of Nintendo's up-and-coming GameCube console, making the game extremely sought after by collectors and increasingly harder to find as time goes on, sending it to the number 7 spot on our list. If you can grab up a copy from your local retro video game store or on the internet, you can find one for about $40 or so for the loose cartridge, and I highly recommend it guys, these mini games are so fun. Coming in at our number 6 spot on our list is Paper Mario. Paper Mario had originally started out as a sequel to the Super Nintendo classic Super Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars, but this wasn't possible due to Square hopping over to develop titles for the Sony PlayStation system. So, Nintendo created Paper Mario in-house. Releasing towards the end of the Nintendo 64's lifespan, on February 5th, 2001, the game was printed in smaller quantities considering, not to mention the lack of advertisement leading to lower sales of the title. This game has drifted farther into the realm of rarity as recent years have passed, and is another highly sought after title for collectors everywhere, earning its spot as number 6 on our list of the rarest N64 titles ever. You can pick up your copy today on eBay or in the wild for around 60 bucks or so. Coming in hot at the number 5 spot is Harvest Moon 64. Harvest Moon 64 is a farming simulation game developed by Natsune for the 64 and released in the US November 30th, 1999. It wasn't well received by fans who were unfamiliar with the franchise, making the game quite easy to pass up for more recognizable titles, resulting in low sales of the game at the time. It wasn't until later releases on the GameCube and the Wii that a fan base began to grow and interest in the older N64 title began to gain traction. Now being sought after by collectors, the game is increasingly harder to find, landing Harvest Moon 64's number 5 spot on our list for the rarest N64 titles. You can find a copy locally or online for around $40 loose, making it one of the cheaper finds on our epic list of gems. Sliding into the spotlight at number 4 is one of my favorite games for the system, Conker's Bad Fur Day. The last game developed by Rare for the Nintendo 64 being released in the US on March 5, 2001, Conker's Bad Fur Day brings the player along for the day in the life of our lovable drunken squirrel protagonist Conker, swinging frying pans at wasps and causing typical squirrel mischief. Conker's Bad Fur Day was released much like a lot of the other games on this list and it was close to the release of the Nintendo GameCube. This paired with limited advertising, little to no endorsement from Nintendo, and a limited demographic being only for adults, impacted the sales of Conker's Bad Fur Day, sending it further into obscurity and seizing the number 4 spot on our list. Copies of this game could be found at your local retro game store for around $60 for the loose cartridge. Coming in at number 3 on our list is Snowboard Kids 2. Released onto the US market on March 2nd, 1999, Snowboard Kids 2 was published by Atlas Games in their trademark limited number fashion, making this game a candidate for extreme rarity from the start. Match that with lackluster reviews and harsh critic scrutiny, Snowboard Kids 2 wasn't a hit on the gaming market for Nintendo, sending this game further into obscurity. Collectors searching for this game could expect to pay anywhere around $75 to $80 online for a loose copy. Number 2 on our list is Clay Fighter 63 and a third The Sculptor's Cut. 
Clay Fighter 63 and a third Sculptor's Cut is a classic style fighting game released on May 15, 1998 for the N64. The Sculptor's Cut was an upgraded version of Clay Fighter 63 and a third. It features four new characters as well as some changes to character combat mechanics and moves. There were thought to have been only around 20,000 cartridges produced in total, and considering the game was a blockbuster rental only, many of them were believed to have been thrown out when Blockbuster made the change to next generation consoles, making the game increasingly more difficult to obtain unless you purchased it from Blockbuster prior to them tossing out hundreds, landing it at the number two spot on our list. A loose cartridge copy will run you anywhere from three to five hundred dollars in the wild depending on condition. And finally, the one you've been waiting for. If you've made it this far in the video, I personally want to thank you for watching and can't wait to deliver you the rarest video game title for the Nintendo 64. Well, let's get right to it guys, the suspense is killing me. The title. Reaching the number one spot on our list for the N64's rarest game ever is... Yoshi Story International Version. Yoshi Story International Version was given out prior to the American release date on March 1st, 1998 as a playable kiosk demo to gauge reactions of Western audiences before the game's launch. The cartridge features all Japanese text and dialogue while being fully playable on Western consoles. The labels are identical other than the International Version being printed directly on the front label as well as the impossible to miss not for resale tag. Copies of this game can fetch a daunting $900 plus dollars on eBay. So if we can all agree on one thing, it's that getting your hands on this is going to put a serious dent in your pocketbook. Well there you have it guys. Thanks for watching my top 10 rarest N64 games video. If you like what you saw here today, don't forget to click the like and subscribe button at the bottom of the page and be sure to ring the bell to stay up to date with all of my videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough again for watching and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Hey guys, it's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I wanted to show you how I fixed my Star Fox for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System with a loose control board here on the inside. Be sure to click the link below to see the tools that I use in order to complete the project, and don't forget to click the like and subscribe button for more awesome retro game content. Without further ado guys, let's get right into it. guys, today we're going to be working on my Star Fox. I uh, bought it from the exchange in this pin. Alrighty guys, today we're going to be working on my Star Fox. I uh, bought it from the exchange and this pin is offset. I know you guys can't see it too well, but uh, anyway, pins ain't lining up and we got a fixer. So let's rip her open and see what we got going on. inside here looks like uh, the board is absolutely tilted you can see that for sure and looks like we found our culprit little piece of plastic seems to have uh, snapped off inside the cart here making the board not sit right so we gotta glue her up gotta fix her let's see what we can do with a little gorilla glue Got a little extra there. A little glue on the fingers never hurt nobody. Stick that right there just like so. The 
this is the official Nintendo method for fixing game cartridges. A little bit of super glue. We're going to hold that right there for a good solid 10. You know how it works. Okay. Got that all squared away. Make sure that any excess glue stripped away. We don't want our cartridge getting stuck in there, that's for sure. Go ahead and just take my little brush here and dust off. I'm going to give that glue some time to dry and then uh, we're going to put her back together, guys. It's going to be fun. As you see, she's not going anywhere now. We're going to put her back together here. Nice and sturdy. And there you have it guys, we have a fixed Star Fox ready to be played. I love it. Well, there you have it, guys. She's all buttoned up and ready to play. Now, if you like what you saw here today, don't forget to click the like and subscribe button at the bottom of the page. And be sure to click the notification bell to stay up to date on all of our videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and I hope this was a helpful video. Have a great day. How's it going guys? Kerr Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming. And today, I wanted to show you how I fixed my Robot Rob for the Nintendo Entertainment System. He had a loose gear mechanism on the inside that wasn't allowing him to move up or down. If you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring the bell to stay up to date on our videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without further ado guys, let's get right into it. guys today we're going to be working on my Star Fox I uh, bought it from the exchange in this pin Alrighty guys, so uh, today we're going to be fixing Rob here. He doesn't move up or down, and I think 
the culprit might be that a uh, gear inside has come unglued. So we're going to take it apart. We're going to see what's going on. It's my favorite part, guys. I tried to set up a few different angles here to give you a good view of what was going on. I want you to be able to see everything that I'm doing. First, we got a Phillips head screwdriver here, just taking apart these little screws. And uh, when you do this, you have to be sure to take it apart upside down. There's a bunch of little gears inside there, and if you take it apart the other way, they're all going to fall out. You're not going to know how to put them back in, and it's going to be horrible. So, there's six in total. All right. Take these arms out here. So there's some glue right inside here on uh, these little gears here and it comes undone and when it does it messes things up and won't allow it to move up or down. So we're going to go ahead and pop this guy out of here and uh, see what's going on. Alrighty guys, this is the gear mechanism that makes Robot Rob move up and down. And there's a little piece of metal here that is held on by three little dabs of glue onto this plastic cog here. And what that does is it catches on the track in the middle and it allows Rob to move up and down. But over time that glue starts to degenerate and uh, makes them stop working. So we're going to have to put some super glue on there, little gorilla and uh, we're gonna fix her up and we're back guys we've got her all glued up and uh, ready to go back into Rob here so what we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up we're gonna put it back into the uh, part of the assembly where it goes we're gonna line it up with the other cogs and then we're gonna be done it's gonna be great we've got all that in there now we have our uh, handy dandy nest cartridges here to help us put these arms back together. It's one of the most difficult parts here. So we're going to slap her back together there, and she should be good to go. And there we have it, guys. Robot Rob. <laughs> All ready to play. As you can see. Yeah, I love it. Well, there you have it, guys. My robot Rob is all fixed and ready to play. Now, if you want to see him in action, be sure to click the links below for the like and subscribe buttons because next week on my channel, I'm doing a full demonstration of robot Rob's capabilities as well as a playthrough of Gyromite. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. How's it going guys? Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today, 
I wanted to show you a demonstration of Robot Rob for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now if you're not sure what Robot Rob is, I suggest you stay tuned and be sure to click the like and subscribe button below. Buckle up your seat belts guys because this is going to be awesome.
Well, there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed my Robot Rob demonstration as much as I did busting the old thing out and playing it. If you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the link below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring the bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits Gaming's videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. How's it going guys? Kerr Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today I wanted to bring to you our comprehensive list of the top 10 rarest GameCube games of all time. If you like what you see here today be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe and don't forget to ring the bell to stay up to date on all of our videos as soon as they're posted. Well without further ado guys let's get right into it. The Nintendo GameCube was released on September 14, 2001.
and was the sixth generation console to be developed by the Japanese based gaming company. Nintendo had some catching up to do after the launch of the N64. While the system was a high selling fan favorite at the time, the N64 was far behind in memory and graphics capabilities of other systems on the market that had already made the switch to compact discs. The GameCube was Nintendo's secret weapon. They kept tucked away to help them compete with Sony's PlayStation 2 and Microsoft's first attempt at home console systems, the Xbox. The Nintendo GameCube soon became a part of nearly every American child's household. Selling nearly 22 million copies in its six year lifespan on the market, the Nintendo GameCube has made its way into the hearts of gamers everywhere, making some of the system's games drift deeper into the realms of rarity and obscurity. Today, we're going to be covering our 2019 list of the rarest GameCube games on the market. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Coming in at the number 10 spot on our list for the rarest GameCube games on the market is Go Go Hypergrind. Go Go Hypergrind is an action skateboarding game released for the GameCube on November 18, 2003. It was developed by the Popanchi team and published by Atlas Games. The player assumes the role of one of eight playable cartoon skateboarders auditioning for an upcoming role in a new hit cartoon. The art style for the game is a collaboration between the Popanchi team and the renowned animation studio Spumco, who are famous for introducing the world to the Rin and Stimpy franchise. And if you've tuned into our rarest N64 games video, you'll already know that Atlas Games is known for releasing their games in such small quantities that many of the publisher's titles are eventually projected into the realm of rarity, and this game is no exception. Due to the increased popularity amongst collectors in recent years, you can expect to pay around $40 or so for this hidden gem at your local game store or online. Happy hunting, folks. The next game on our list is honestly one of my favorite games for the system. The game stealing the show at the number 9 spot on our list is the Sonic Adventure 2 Pack, Player's Choice. The Sonic Adventure 2 Pack was a special retail promotion that contained Player's Choice editions of both Sonic Adventure DX and Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. While the covers of the games on the inside are identical to their standard releases, the outside cardboard that contains the two games is what makes this title surprisingly rare. Collectors attempting to land themselves a copy of this game can expect to pay around $160 US for the cardboard box alone, making this one of the hardest games to acquire on our list of rare gems. Moving on in at the number 8 spot on our list is Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. Fire Emblem Path of Radiance is a tactical role playing game developed by Intelligent Systems and published in house by Nintendo on April 20, 2005. Being the ninth game in the Fire Emblem series, Path of Radiance was well received by audiences and helped Nintendo establish a loyal fan base here in the West. With groundbreaking gameplay, smooth graphics, and a well-placed pre-promotional character cameo in the Super Smash Bros. series, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance soon became a must-have for game collectors everywhere, sending this title higher up into the price charts and further into obscurity. Folks searching for a copy of this game can expect to spend anywhere between $80 to $150 out in the wild, making this title extremely rare and landing it at the number 8 spot on our list. Coming in at the number 7 spot on our list is Fantasy Star Online Episodes 1 and 2 Plus. Released to the US market in October 2003, Fantasy Star Online was originally published on the Dreamcast, and after a noble attempt by Sega to establish the Dreamcast as a major player in the online console wars, Sega decided to port the franchise to the Nintendo GameCube and Xbox systems to better utilize their online capabilities. The Plus version of this game included countless bug fixes, as well as a plethora of additional content both on and offline. Collectors looking to get their hands on a copy of this treasure can expect to pay the upwards of $80 US, making Fantasy Star Online for the GameCube sure to put a dent in your pocketbook, earning its seat at the number 7 spot on our list. Stealing the show at the number 6 spot on our list of rarest GameCube titles is Disney Sports Basketball. Being released to Western audiences on January 13, 2003, Disney Sports Basketball is a classic court-style basketball game featuring everyone's favorite Disney characters. Published by Konami towards the beginning of the GameCube's lifespan on the market, Disney and Konami attempted to capitalize off of Disney's steadfast popularity, but unfortunately, the game wasn't well received by critics, sending this game off the store shelves and onto our list of the rarest GameCube titles. Collectors can snag their copy today online or locally for around 60 bucks US. 
Sliding in at the number 5 spot on our list is an interesting twist on action-adventure games, and to be honest, it's a title that most people listening in might not have heard of. Number 5 on our list is Cubivore, Survival of the Fittest. Released to Western audiences on November 5th, 2002, Cubivore was a unique action-adventure game that had players assume the role of a lowly Cubivore. Players would need to eat up other Cubivores in order to evolve, in hopes of eventually defeating a vicious tyrant known as Killer Cubivore. While being published by Nintendo in Japan, Atlas Games took over distribution in the States, following suit with their limited number run and projecting this game straight into rarity from the start. Despite Atlas ultimately creating a second run of Cubivore to meet consumer demand, the game is still widely considered rare and to this day holds a high value amongst collectors. Folks trying to get their hands on a copy of the game should expect to pay around $80 US, making Cubivore one of the more difficult finds on this epic list of gems. Coming in hot at the number 4 spot is one of the more unexpected titles on this list. As we all know in the collector's world, sports games are commonly a dime a dozen, and were drastically overproduced, making them extremely easy to find and relatively easy on the pocketbook. NCAA 2K3 is a clear exception to the rule. Released on December 2nd by Sega in 2002, NCAA 2K3 was a widely popular basketball franchise. Being released on both competitor systems, the GameCube port was overshadowed by prevalent online capabilities of the Xbox and the PlayStation 2 consoles, causing Sega to stop making the GameCube version halfway through production, sending this game into extreme rarity. Collectors or sports fans searching for a copy of this game should expect to pay a whopping $150 US for the game, making it one of the more expensive titles on our list of rare GameCube titles. Nearing the top of our list here and taking the number 3 spot for the rarest GameCube games on the market isn't just one game, it's two of Nintendo's best action-packed titles neatly crammed into one beautifully rare box. Here to take the number 3 spot on our list is Metroid Prime Wind Waker Combo Pack. This rare double game pack was a console exclusive that was put out by Nintendo in 2005 during the holiday season. The case features the covers for both Wind Waker and Metroid Prime on the front, as well as two separate GameCube discs on the inside containing the two separate games. Considering the combo pack was a console bundle and limited numbers were sold during the holiday season, tracking down a copy of this amazing package deal would be easier said than done. If you can find a copy out in the wild or at your local game store, be ready to spend a whopping $150 for this beauty. Happy hunting, folks. Dropping in at the number two spot on our list is Gotcha Force. Gotcha Force was developed and published by Capcom for the Nintendo GameCube and released to Western audiences on December 3rd, 2003. Gotcha Force was a fighting, third-person shooting hybrid that was developed towards the end of 2003. The GameCube was facing forceful competition from the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox, causing a fair amount of the GameCube's titles to be widely overlooked. Gotcha Force was one of those games. Feeling the heat from the rivals, Capcom printed Gotcha Force in a very limited run, with Japanese audiences receiving a second print in 2012. But unfortunately for American consumers, no such release is in the works, sending this game further into obscurity and on our list of rarest GameCube games. Collectors searching for a copy of Gotcha Force can expect to pay around $120 US, making it one of the more expensive games on our list of rare GameCube titles. Now, for the one you've been waiting for. If you're still watching, I can't thank you enough, and I couldn't be more excited to bring you the rarest Nintendo GameCube title ever. The title. Coming in at our number one spot for the rarest GameCube game of all time is... Pokemon Box. Released on July 12, 2004, Pokemon Box was a game that was designed for the Nintendo GameCube, which allowed players to store the Pokemon that they caught during their journey in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. The game integrated the use of the Game Boy Advance GameCube transfer cable, and allowed players to conveniently store the Pokemon they had caught during their time playing. The North American version of Pokemon Box was only available for purchase via online or at Nintendo's World Store in New York making this game extremely hard to get your hands on and sending it further into rarity as the years have went on. Folks attempting to get a copy of Pokemon Box can plan on paying around $140. Happy hunting, folks. Well, there you have it, guys. This has been our top 10 list of the rarest GameCube games of all time. Now, if you stuck around this long, I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and if you like what you saw here today, 
Be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with our videos as soon as they're posted. Thanks again for watching, you guys. This has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. How's it going, guys? Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I wanted to try something a little bit different. I've, uh, been collecting a lot of games through the month of May, and I thought it'd be a really good idea to kind of bring them all together and show you guys a monthly pickups video. So, this is the first ever Outlaw Bits Gaming monthly pickups video. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and I hope you enjoy it. Alrighty guys, the first set of pickups on our list is uh, from a solo trip that I took up to the disc replay on 31 here in Indianapolis. And I was so excited that day. I got on Facebook and uh, towards the bottom of the page I saw that the Worms Armageddon had gotten back into the store. Because about a week beforehand, I saw it on there, I called them immediately and somebody had already gotten it within it being posted for an hour. So I was super stoked to get it. Um, I brought it home that night and we streamed it live if you caught that but it's a great multiplayer game guys it's a tactical strategy game um, you take the role of these little worms and they're trying to kill each other with badass weapons it's pretty cool if you've never played it I really suggest trying to pick it up or finding a buddy who has it uh, it costs about $129 or so so it's a little hard on the pocketbook but it's totally worth it and uh, the second game I picked up that day was Super Smash Brothers. And I actually had 20% off in the store. And you can see the condition of the uh, label is a little bit dis discolored. So the game was drastically cheaper. And my 20% off actually paid for the game. So win-win, guys. We landed the next set of pickups at the Disc Replay on East Washington Street. Now I'm going to hand it over to my lovely girlfriend, Laura, and she's going to tell you what we got. Alrighty, baby, show them what you got. <laughs> okay, so it's actually a really good day. We went and found uh, Crash Bandicoot 2. We got Cortex Strikes Back. Hey. The case, however, is a little bit damaged, so we'll have to find something good for that. Um, a little bit random, didn't really expect to get this, but we got Adventure Time. Hey, Ice King, why'd you steal our garbage? Um, $3, thought I'd get it, because I love Adventure Time. The garbage thief. Uh, <laughs> And this was actually a really cool find. This was an anime I used to watch back in the day. So this is a collector's edition, which I read on the back, and it actually has a full art gallery, a CD soundtrack. Uh, let's see, the Japanese and English audio sub and dub. So this is a really cool find if you know anybody was into this anime back in the day. So yeah, that was the disc replay day for me. Solid, solid finds. As Laura was saying, the first game that we picked up was Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Crash Bandicoot franchise. It's an awesome platformer that was developed for the PlayStation, and uh, it's super fun. We've been trying to get them slowly but surely, and for $9.99, I couldn't pass it up. I'm not too worried about the case. Um, it is heavily damaged, but we'll swap that out with something else. No big deal. The second game we picked up that day was Adventure Time. Hey Ice King, why'd you steal our garbage? That's not very nice. You journey through the land of Ooh and you find perilous dungeons, radical treasure, and monsters to punch in a quest of never-ending fun. Um, you take the role of Jake and Finn. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's super cool. It uh, uses the 2DS and the 3DS capabilities, which I thought was super neat. But uh, yeah, we're super stoked to play this and we're really happy that we picked it up. Now the last game that we picked up that day 
was uh, Okami for the Wii. And I've been really stoked to play this for a long time. I've seen a couple reviews here on YouTube about it. And I like anything that Capcom puts out. The really cool, um, really great studio. And I like the way that it utilizes the uh, Wii Remote. It's a paintbrush of sorts. I don't think the PlayStation 2 had that. So uh, super stoked to give it a try. After I play Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, after I get that game conquered, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a shot. So... Now before we embarked on our journey to get this last game on our epic pickups list, Laura and I stopped by one of our favorite sushi bars on the north side of Castleton, The Journey. Here's some footage of our epic pre-pickups dinner date. So good. So freaking good. Good baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, we just finished up our dinner there at the Journey, and uh, we're stuffed to say the least. I'm bulging. Alrighty, guys, we just got here to the exchange. We're about to hop inside and see if they got our game in. Woo. The last game that we picked up in the month of May comes from the exchange in Castleton. And uh, honestly, it's one that I'm the most excited about. From a collector standpoint, this is the holy grail for the PlayStation 2 for me. We picked up Futurama for the PlayStation 2. Now, we hunted this game for months and months, working tirelessly trying to find it. We called so many game stores, every single game store in the state, some game stores out of state, multiple times a week. And we finally got our hands on it, and I am so excited. Um, the awesome guys at the exchange got it sent in from another store, and we couldn't be happier to have it, guys. It's essentially a 3D platformer, and basically what it is is a lost episode of Futurama. So if you're a fan of the series, you just gotta get it. Um, it's gonna put a dent in your pocketbook. It's about a hundo. It has 30 minutes of original cinematics and original cast voiceovers. You get to play as Fry, Leela, Bender, and Dr. Zoidberg, which I was so excited about because Zoidberg is the man. So yeah, guys, that'll do it. This has been our uh, monthly pickups video for the month of May. And if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like, subscribe, and don't forget to ring the bell to stay up to date on all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed this first monthly pickups video. I just wanted to kind of try something new, so be sure to leave your feedback in the comments section and let me know what you think. This has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. How's it going guys? Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I've decided to talk about some of the juiciest secrets and easter eggs for one of the most beloved N64 games of all time. Today, we're going to be digging in deep and searching for some hidden secrets and easter eggs buried within The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask. Now if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Without further ado guys, let's get right into it.
The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is a timeless classic loved and revered by avid video game enthusiasts and casual video gamers alike. Receiving an upgraded engine and a full-fledged remaster for the 3DS with enhanced graphics and 3D capabilities. Majora's Mask is a truly unique and beautifully done masterpiece with a small but all too immersive world riddled with easter eggs and secrets. Today, we're going to be exploring the world of Termina and unraveling some of the developer's most lucrative and cleverly placed easter eggs. The player doesn't have to travel far to find our first easter egg. Upon Link being transformed into the Deku Scrub and exiting the Lost Woods, he'll eventually run into the Happy Mask Salesman at the bottom of the clock tower. Not only does this NPC bear a striking resemblance to the series creator Shigeru Miyamoto, but his backpack is also adorned with the masks of a few notable characters. Head for the back of the Happy Mask Salesman and enter first person mode. The player can't miss Nintendo's mascot and beloved character Mario looking down on them from the salesman's backpack. To the left of Mario is a mask that bears a shocking resemblance to the one and only King, Elvis Presley himself. And above that is a mask that some refer to as the Darth Maul mask, though this has been unconfirmed by Nintendo. Peering over the Happy Mask Salesman's left shoulder from the front side will reveal a mask that distinctively resembles the face plastered on the front of the mirror shield. And to the right of Mario is a mask that's rumored to represent Falco from the Star Fox series or King DDD from Kirby, but both of those have been unconfirmed. Upon acquiring the powder keg from either the Goron Village or the bomb shop in town, the player can then enter Romani Ranch, which harbors two delightful sisters preparing for an impending invasion on their ranch. If the player enters first person mode and stares at the brooches of either Crimea or Romani, they might just notice a popular video game series protagonist hidden in plain sight, as the brooches resemble Bowser from the Mario series. Another little fun fact about Romani Ranch is that in the 3DS rendition of Majora's Mask, players can travel up to the Romani sister's bedroom, and upon entering the room, they'll find a stuffed replica of Epona sitting up on a mantle and a fluffed up version of Ganon's mighty stallion Gallows from Ocarina of Time. Pretty neat. Speaking of the 3DS version, once the player enters the Goron Village, if they seek out the Elder Son's room and enter first person mode to the left of his son, they'll spot a stoned, carved Wii remote sitting amongst the toddler's toys. Pretty cool stuff, guys. Bringing it back to the bomb shop on the 3DS version, viewers might have noticed a quite large machine sitting stationary behind the bomb shop's owner. If you look close at the machine, players will soon realize the texture of the machine is none other than the Nintendo GameCube. And you know Nintendo couldn't leave out the Game Boy disk drive on the bottom. Nice touch. Heading over to the observatory, Link will soon discover an assortment of pots ripe for the smashing. Destroying these pots will reveal small scraps of paper, one of which revealing an illustration of a dolphin, a sly reference to Nintendo's up-and-coming next-generation console, the GameCube, which was codenamed the Dolphin throughout its entire production. After entering Clock Town, proceed back to the Clock Tower where Link meets the Happy Mask Salesman for the first time, and proceed to jump into the aqueduct behind him. If the player swims all the way down to the bottom whilst wearing the Zora's mask and moves towards the large floating pieces of algae, they might notice that the texture carries a distinct resemblance to that of an N64 controller. Not the juiciest of Easter eggs, but interesting nonetheless. Heading back to the Zora's domain, Link needs to have the Zora mask equipped for this Easter egg. Once you've done that, enter the room behind the first door on the right where the player will be greeted by the drummer Tojo. If you listen carefully to the beat Tojo's playing on his drum set, it's the cave music theme from The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Pretty cool stuff. Moving into the next room, we'll come across the Indiegogo's quiet bass player Joppas playing the Underworld theme song from the original Legend of Zelda for the NES. And finally, in the last room, we'll stumble upon Evan, the pianist and the leader of the Indiegogo's. If you listen closely, you can hear the somber tones of the game over screen from the original Legend of Zelda. Heading outside of the city walls and into the northern part of Termina Field, the player can come across a drawing of Skull Kid, illustrated on a wall. Inscribed below him are a series of notes that after being played with the ocarina give Link a fair amount of rupees. If played at the correct time and pattern, the player will hear a familiar melody of the warp song from Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Pretty neat. If the player is using an emulator and has the ability to enable the levitation code, 
Another picture of Skull Kid can be observed from the sky overlooking Termina Field near the observatory. Our next egg takes place at the Clock Town Inn. Enter Ange's grandmother's room and take a peek behind the old girl's chair. There you'll see a rather detailed picture of a tiger. This is a reference to Granny's doppelganger in Ocarina of Time and her pet tiger respectively. If Link turns around and looks at the bookshelf, the player will notice a small cow statuette sitting on the shelf. On the final day, the ground will begin to rumble as the moon plummets closer and closer to Termina. Return to Granny's room at the inn and find these statuettes again. This time, their heads will shake and bobble about as the rumbles of impending doom ring on. Pretty cool, right? On the 3DS version, a photo on the wall can be found that depicts a flying saucer ironically placed directly next to a picture of the Romani sisters. A little foreshadowing? On the 3DS version of Majora's Mask, after the player enters Cafe's hideout, they have the opportunity to stumble upon yet another awesome throwback to a classic Nintendo icon, tucked away in between some old storage crates, nested within the back of the curiosity shop. Look to the lower right hand corner of the screen and you'll notice a cleverly placed Rob the Robot staring in Link's direction. Nice touch, Nintendo. Also on the 3DS version of Majora's Mask, if Link enters the Marine Research Lab and heads over to the workbench filled with jars, a Nintendo Love Tester can be found amongst the beakers, which was a popular Nintendo toy from the 1960s. The final 3DS Easter egg on our list is in the Town Shooting Gallery. When Link enters the shooting gallery located on the counter next to the shopkeep is a peculiar jar-shaped object. This object is the Nintendo Tumblr Puzzle. Pretty nice nod to the days of old for Nintendo. Traveling now to the deserts of Icona, once Link enters the Icona Castle Courtyard, he can follow a path to the top of the map to eventually find a paper airplane sitting stationary on the southwestmost tower in the region. It's speculated that this is a gentle nod to the upcoming Paper Mario game that was due to be released that year, but this hasn't been confirmed by Nintendo, so as of right now, it's merely speculation. Nintendo has somewhat of a reputation for sneaking in cameos and character crossovers of their most iconic characters within their games, stemming all the way back to the NES days, and Majora's Mask is no exception. Enter the mask selection screen and head down to the second row for our very last easter egg of the video. The entire second row consists of some very familiar faces hidden unsuspectingly right under our noses. All of the masks in the row are meant to resemble members of the Star Fox team. The Keaton mask represents the team leader Fox McCloud. The Bremen mask is meant to illustrate Falco Lombardi. The Bunny Hood is a spitting image of Peppy Hare. Don Jiro's mask is a gentle nod to Slippy the Toad. And the Mask of Sense is a tip of the hat to Pigma Dengar, who was an enemy from the original Star Fox for the Super Nintendo and was once a member of Star Fox Elite Team but went rogue. Well, there you have it, guys. This concludes our hunt for all of the Easter eggs buried within The Legend of Zelda, Majora's Mask. Now, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I hope this video was super informative for you guys, and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. How's it going guys? Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today, I thought I'd do a brief overview of all of the inbox Game Boy systems I have, as well as an unboxing to show you guys the contents of the inside. So if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without further ado guys, let's get right into it.
Alrighty guys, the first Game Boy we're going to go over today is my uh, original Game Boy. Now, I got this from a huge lot that I had bought off of a guy in Nashville, and uh, a huge chunk of my collection actually came from that. But I was super excited. Um, it came with the original Tetris on the inside. I thought that was really cool. It has all of the manuals, the booklets, and the cables. So that was super dope as well. Uh, I can't be happier to have it, guys. I love having it in the collection, and it's just so cool that it's boxed. Yep. Alrighty, guys. This is my uh, inbox Game Boy, and I was super excited when I got it in the lot. Um, I had always wanted one. Super cool. There's a little shot of the front there. Pretty crisp. That side angle view. We got the accessory pouches and stuff like that on the side there. And uh, yeah, there's some gameplay footage as well as the back. Shows the headphone accessories. I thought that was really cool. Now inside the styrofoam here, we've got the protective cover there. We have an awesome, awesome Metroid poster. And I actually just discovered this today. I've looked through this box multiple times and just ran upon it. So uh, yeah, I thought that was really cool. It's got some cool Game Boy games and advertisement there on the back. Now, uh, the next item here is the little booklet, the operation manual, in case you wanted to get well versed on the ins and outs of your Game Boy. Pretty neat. And here we have a uh, mail-in subscription for Nintendo, so that's pretty cool. And the most awesome part of this entire display is this really rad mail-in Nintendo Power poster. I just love those 80s freaking graphics, dude. The art was amazing. Pretty solid stuff. So getting down to the brass tacks here, we've got the original Game Boy. Pristine condition. Got the 1-800 Nintendo number on the back. I'm tickled to death by those. When I was a kid, I always wanted to call it. My parents wouldn't let me. We've got the original Tetris here, as well as the Game Boy Link cable. So yeah, pretty solid. The next thing we're going to cover is uh, my Game Boy camera. Now, I had wanted a Game Boy camera for a long time, and my girlfriend and I had stumbled into the disc replay on East Washington Street. And I actually uh, saw a camera and a printer the same exact day. So you guys know I had to snag them both. But uh, it's pretty cool. If you guys have never messed with it before, this thing took selfies before selfies were selfies. So it's pretty cutting edge, pretty awesome for the time. There were a couple games that you could play with it as well. But uh, yeah, we mostly like to take pictures and print them out. It's pretty neat. Next up, we're going to uh, dig into my Game Boy camera here. Nice little back shot there. You can see the pictures of the selfies other people have taken and such. I love that little Nintendo seal there on the bottom. Super crisp. Super crisp. Now, uh, digging inside this guy, we have the Game Boy camera and some informational booklets. Now, uh, the Game Boy camera, it's really awesome. It's a cool peripheral, allows you to take selfies and such. Uh, this green one's in pretty good condition. You can tell that uh, it wasn't used very much. And I just love the booklet for the Game Boy camera. They just, they added these little twists to all the art styles. See how there's like Game Boys and such on the pages in the background? It's just super neat. Every one of these consoles has something a little bit different to it, and I just love it. Next item we have here, complete in box, is my uh, Game Boy printer. Now I got this the same day as the uh, Game Boy camera, like I said. We got it from the disc replay. And it's a super neat little peripheral, guys. Um, you use these little tiny spools of paper, and they actually have ink on them already. So basically, the Game Boy printer just helps you transfer that over with all the pictures that you take with the Game Boy camera. Uh, it's pretty cool. It has the manual inside as well as the cables and the printer with two extra sealed spools of paper. So couldn't be happier about that, guys. 
Alrighty guys, so the next piece we have here is my inbox Game Boy printer. Pretty cool graphics there on the back that show you the capabilities of what it can do. Um, yeah, there's a few pieces of tape on it, but I really don't mind that. I really just wanted one in the box. There's little spools of paper that hold the ink. And uh, that one's sealed, so that's pretty cool. And there we are. Got our cables in there as well. And some informational booklets. Alright, so we're going to look at the printer here first, guys. It has a uh, power button on the side. It has some serial information on the back. And uh, that red button there allows you to test the paper roll and to actually feed some through. Then we have our operational instruction booklet here. See, we're back to booklets with the printer. Um, it's pretty neat. It's really informative. And I actually 100% had to read the manual to know how to use it. So it's kind of difficult. But once you get the hang of it, it's easy peasy, man. And then there is our roll that holds the ink. That's what your pictures are going to print out on. Pretty neat stuff. The next little gem we have here is my inbox Game Boy Pocket. Now, I absolutely love the Game Boy Pocket. When I was a kid, I had one, and uh, it was just perfect to play on the go. So, it's one of the most prideful parts of my, uh, my collection here, and this actually has the purchase date of 5-27-98. So, that's really cool. It's really cool to see when it was bought. Um, I'd love to know the store it came from. I think that stuff's really interesting, kind of more of the history of it all. But yeah, guys, pretty sick. Now, like I said, this is one of my favorite consoles from uh, that era. I just love the Game Boy. It was so small. It could fit in my pocket. I could take it on the go. Now, this isn't a complete inbox, but it is inbox. <laughs> it doesn't have any manuals or anything like that. I got it as a part of that lot, and the guy actually used to have the box hanging on his wall. So, since he had the Game Boy Pocket as well, I just put it back in there and... Uh, Put it up on display but yeah it's in pretty good condition and uh, the serial numbers and everything like that are all right so we're good to go now this this is my Game Boy Atomic Purple color in box and uh, a pretty interesting story behind it one day we were at the disc replay on East Washington Street and I had seen that they had just the box for this Atomic Purple Game Boy, and it was only around eight bucks. I was gonna go ahead and pick it up anyway, but I had an inkling to go over and check the used Game Boy section. And at the very bottom of the pile sat an Atomic Purple Game Boy Color. So even though it wasn't the original Game Boy that came in this box, I got the Game Boy, I got the box, and here we are. So yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff, guys. Alrighty guys, so next here we have my Atomic Purple Game Boy Color, and uh, it's pretty neat. A little plastic in there with some instructional booklets and things. We've got the system there, pretty good condition. The serial numbers on the back are uh, pretty alright shape. Now we've got some informational booklets here, and I just love having these. The box is cool, but having the stuff on the inside, it just puts it all together for me. Got our operation manual, pamphlet style for the Game Boys instead of a booklet. Loads of info on there, guys. Better start studying. Moving on here, we have our regular instruction manual, also in pamphlet form. Not too shabby. Shows you the ins and the outs, the ratings and such. And then for our last piece here, we have this awesome Nintendo ad. Are you hungry? <laughs> awesome games don't come in cans, guys. Got some cool art there on the inside. Pretty solid stuff. Very nice. 
Well, there you have it, guys. This has been my brief overview of all of my inbox Game Boy systems. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope that it was super informative for you. And if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough again for watching, and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. How's it going guys? Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I wanted to give you a brief tour and overview of a local uh, arcade that we have here in the Indianapolis area. It's called Boss Battle Games, and if you guys haven't been there, I highly suggest it. It is super cool. Um, I got some great footage of their weekly Super Smash Brothers tournament called Salty Sundays. So it should be pretty cool, guys. If you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without further ado, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so here's our tour of Boss Battle Games. I don't know if you can see it on the sign there, but they offer a one hour play for $5 or unlimited play all day long for 10 bucks. And uh, you'll get a little wristband when you walk in the door, and then you're free to enter. They got DDR on the left there. Plenty of people filling up these arcades, guys. This is a super awesome place, and I've been coming here since they opened up on East Washington Street. They currently moved to... Uh, uh, a new location in Castleton at the mall, and it's super awesome. Got a little time crisis there on our right. We got some fighting games here, as well as the final fight decal painted on the wall there. Super cool stuff. A couple more arcade systems there. We have the original Super Mario Brothers with the versus mode going on. Pretty neat, guys. Here's some more games there. They had a couple multi-cabs. Here we go. There was a Simpsons on my right. We got some racing games here. Whole wall full. We've got the original Super Mario Bowser fight painted on the wall, which I thought was super cool. That right there is the original F-Zero arcade machine. And right here on our left, we have X-Men, which is one of my favorite arcade games of all time because you can play with so many people. Over here on our right, we have what I call the console cage. They have um, a few Xboxes and some Super Nintendos in there, set up with Guitar Hero and other games for you to enjoy. Got the cages for some theft prevention, I assume. We've got our pinball machines and our fighters with the awesome Mortal Kombat logo painted there on the ceiling. Or on the wall, rather. Pretty cool stuff, guys. They have a wide array of retro games for sale. Got some uh, NES and Super Nintendo on this side. Got some Super Famicom on the other side, as well as a lot more imports. Um, over here are the N64s, and there are some solid, solid games in there. I actually got uh, my Pokemon Stadium import from here. Got Zelda there. Of course, we got the Mario Parties on top. Got an Atari 7800. Super solid. And here we go, guys. On to Salty Sunday. Let's see what this Super Smash Brothers tournament's all about, shall we? Oh, man, this hallway was so rad. Just awesome posters everywhere. We got the Super Smash Brothers there. And here it is, guys. I was in utter shock when I walked in. This place was so packed and it was so popping. Really awesome people. 
Had some astounding art on the wall here. Just, just amazing. You got the two Gyaradoses fighting up there, the shiny and the regular blue. But yeah, the turnout was super amazing and everybody was so positive. We've got the Samus here, firing at Ridley. I thought that was super sick. Very talented artist did all of this. We've got the King DDD here on this wall, which I thought was really interesting. Um, an actual player at the contest actually commissioned to have that painted on the wall because he wanted King DDD up there. This guy was super cool, man. He was actually fixing and um, modifying controllers during the competition. And uh, I thought that was super neat. He was actually raffling off an LED controller that he had made. And it was very entrepreneurial, and I got mad respect for that. This dude was cool. Look at him. Yeah. Now, the reason I came was to see my buddy Brad and my buddy Jed here. And uh, as you can see, they are deep in it. My buddy Jed was facing this cat. It was a really good match to watch. And um, yeah. I really love this stuff, guys. It's all about hanging out with friends and having a good time, and that's what everybody here was doing, so you couldn't have asked for a better time. Here we got a shot of uh, Dustin, and he is making announcements and shot calling there on the megaphone. Super awesome, dude, and I'm really thankful that they let me come in there and film. It was great. Eventually, I had my fill of the tournament, and it was time to go, guys. I uh, saw some really good matches and met some fun people. Figured I'd check out this hallway one more time out the door. And, uh, yeah. Well, there you have it, guys. This concludes my brief tour and overview of Boss Battle Games and my coverage of Salty Sundays, their weekly Super Smash Brothers tournament. Now, if you like what you saw here today... Be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have an amazing week, and I'll see you next time. This has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. How's it going, guys? Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today... We're going to be going over the pickups that Laura and I collected during the month of June. Now if you like what you see here today, be sure to slam that like button and subscribe below. And don't forget to ring the notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without further ado guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, the first games we picked up in the month of June were uh, at the exchange, the new one actually, that opened up on East Washington Street. And by the way, better stay tuned uh, for the weeks to follow because I'm going to be doing a live tour. We got some great footage while we were in there. But the first two games that I got were Animal Crossing Wild World and Animal Crossing New Leaf. Now I'm absolutely a huge fan of the Animal Crossing series. I've been playing since the GameCube days. Um, I even have the Japanese import of the N64 version. I have yet to play it, but I love it. I'm super excited to get to play it eventually. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was really happy to pick these up. I've been playing New Leaf so much. And uh, it's a super fun game. You get to take over as mayor. And who doesn't want to be the mayor of the town? I've always kind of wanted to be a mayor. So yeah, it's pretty neat. And uh, the next games we got... If you guys had watched our $10 disc replay challenge video earlier this month, um, we got all these games there during this challenge. And basically, we had to find the best game that we possibly could for 10 bucks, the worst game that we possibly could for 5 bucks. And I think we did pretty good, guys. Um, first one I picked up that day was Metal Gear Solid The Phantom Pain goes without saying it's a great great series and uh, Hideo Kojima is a genius so I was really excited to get it and add it to the collection I've had it before but uh, I sold it back in the day to get another game and 
The game that Laura picked up that day was Blaze Blue for the Nintendo 3DS. And it's a Street Fighter style kind of fighting game. It's super cool. It's really story driven. And she played it for a bit and really liked it. So yeah, super stoked about that one. Now for the worst games on our challenge, um, I picked up iCarly for the DS, and it's bad, guys. There's no sugarcoating it here. You uh, have to recreate some of the scenes from iCarly, and it's just, it's god-awful. But it was all in good fun, and I'm glad we picked it up either way. And the game that Laura got that day was NSYNC Get to the Show. And she definitely stole the show with this game. She definitely won and took the cake on that one. Because this has to be the worst game in existence. Sealed in box. But yeah, super stoked about that one as well. And then if you guys have been keeping up with my streams this month, you'll know that I've been rocking out on some Super Mario Maker. I am really happy that I picked this up. It is so much fun, and uh, I just absolutely love playing the community levels. It's been really cool. So if you haven't tuned into a stream yet, drop in on the next one, shoot me your levels, and we'll play together. Be super great. The last game that I got this month came from the exchange on uh, 82nd Street, I believe, in Castleton. And I was really excited to pick this up, too. I've been getting more into getting some sealed games. I got a sealed Legend of Zelda a couple months back, and I got a sealed, factory sealed F-Zero. Got the Player's Choice Edition, so I gotta find the original regular edition as well. But yeah, guys, I was super excited to get it. Um, it was 50 bucks. It's pretty reasonably priced for it. So yeah, had to pick it up. Well, there you have it, guys. This has been our pickups video for the month of June. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. We found some pretty good stuff this month, and I'm really happy about it. Now, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching. And this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. How's it going guys? Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming. And today, I wanted to give you a brief tour of one of my favorite game stores here in Indianapolis that just recently opened up a new location on the east side. That is The Exchange. It's a super awesome place. The people are really friendly when you go in there. It's a really great environment. So uh, yeah, we're going to be showcasing some of the ins and outs and all the best features of the game store. Now if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Without further ado guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, the lovely uh, Miss Laura and I hopped in the old Malibu, made our way up to the East Washington Street Exchange. It's a brand new one they just opened up and we're super excited to check it out. Can't wait to get up in there. And here we have it guys. Here's the new exchange, now open for business. Be sure to drop on in. Now we were in complete utter awe when we walked in here. They just had so many games, and uh, my mind was blown, to be honest. Here we got a little Nintendo end cap with uh, Zelda and Mario Kart there. Got a little Animal Crossing City Folk. Pretty cool. Animal Crossing is one of my favorite series of all time. 
We've got another uh, end cap here with Yoshi's Crafted World. I've been really excited about picking that one up. We've got these $80 Joy-Cons here. Easy, Nintendo. Take it easy on us. We've got a Nintendo Switch and some other cool items there. And if we head around the corner here, we have a wide variety of imports. Now, this is really impressive. Um, most places, when you go in there, they'll have one import, maybe two. But they had such a huge variety and some pretty obscure ones as well. So that was really neat. Heading on over here, we got the classic Super Nintendo with plenty of heavy hitters filling the cases here. We had Mario's Missing, NBA Jam, Star Wars. We've got the Player's Choice Zelda Link to the Past there. We've got a wide assortment of NES titles here. Starting off with the Burger Time, which happens to be Laura's personal favorite, so that's pretty cool. Moving on over to the Nintendo Switch section, we've got the corded Donkey Kong controller. And uh, I want to add that to the collection soon. I've got a couple other ones, and I uh, need that one to complete it. So, Moving to our left here, we have a plethora of N64 titles. We've got Pokemon Stadium 2 here. It's my favorite. For the GameCube, we've got uh, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, which is one of the rarest titles for the console, so that's pretty cool. Sonic Adventure 2 Battle there. We've got a couple Zeldas here on the end. Pretty sick stuff. Now up here we have these fully licensed Nintendo posters. A uh, awesome addition to the decor of any gamer's room. Here we've got another uh, Game Boy end cap. We've got everything in here from the 3DX L to the original Game Boy, so that's pretty cool. They've even got some inbox stuff up there. We have a wide array of 3DS games and uh, DS games as well. Any game that I could think of that I wanted to pick up, they had it. So they just have such a good variety and their inventory is really impressive. Very nice people too. Moving on over here, we have some awesome Wii U titles. We got the old Kirby there and uh, the Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival. Still need that to complete my collection. Got the Splatoon there and the Star Fox. Over here, we have some action figures and some uh, comic book memorabilia. That's what's cool about the exchange. There's something for everybody here. It's not just video games. But yeah, pretty sick stuff, guys. Moving on over here, we have an awesome assortment of manuals and art books. We got the Dragon Age 2 strategy guide there. We got the Last of Us walkthrough, a uh, little Mega Man. What I was most excited about was this Metroid Fusion sealed booklet. Thought that was pretty neat. Awesome illustration book there. Pretty cool stuff. They have a wide array of uh, pops and they have something for everybody here too, man. Some awesome stuff. I found these South Park ones and I was so excited. The Kenny and the Mr. Hanky just cracked me up. And then to end the tour, guys, uh, yeah, we got some vinyls here. They also sell CDs and vinyls, so like I said, there's just something for everybody. Well, there you have it, guys. This has been our brief overview and tour of the new exchange on East Washington Street. Laura and I had such time filming this, and I want to give her a special thanks for doing some amazing filming in the location. Well, if you like what you saw here today, guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and I'll see you next Friday. This has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on my outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be doing a complete cartridge restoration of one of my favorite games for the N64 and that is Pokemon Snap. Now uh, this is one of my games in my collection that's needed a dressing for a long time. It's pretty dirty, it's pretty ate up with stickers guys as you can see. So today I'm going to be giving you all of the tips and tricks that I've learned throughout the years of retro video game collecting and we're going to get this puppy all shined up. Now if you like what you see here today be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. 
Well, without further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, today we're going to be uh, shining up my Pokemon Snap and as you can see it has some stickers on there and some uh, heavy sticker residue. On the back it has a clear plastic sticker from Blockbuster over the label and some permanent marker. Also a little bit on the top there. But yeah, we're going to get it knocked out guys. It's got some uh, heavy dirt here on the pins and we're going to be using an old school cartridge cleaner which is similar to a one up card. And uh, yeah, guys, it's going to be awesome. They're really effective. If you've never used one before, they're super handy to have. The first thing we're going to need is some handy dandy isopropyl alcohol, the most important ingredient in this entire project. Next thing we're going to need is some Goo Gone for that uh, hard to scrub sticker residue. It's really useful, guys. And of course, for some scrubbing power, we're going to use these handy dandy Q-tips. Last thing we're going to need is this awesome hair dryer for the stickers and this super cool old school one-up cartridge cleaner. Got some instructions on the back there. Let's get right into it, guys. As you can see, you're going to uh, spend about two or three minutes heating up the cartridge. Try not to get it too hot. And then when you're ready, just start peeling away, guys. It's so satisfying. There we go. She is looking solid. Moving on to this uh, sticker residue here on the uh, right side of the cartridge. Let's see what we can do with this hair dryer. And we've got it, guys. With a little thumb action there, we can get it scraped off. And then it's ready for Goo Gone later on. Looking sharp. Now the next thing that we need to address is this um, clear plastic label on the front here. Blockbuster put it on there. And don't remove it or you will uh, damage your label. But what we're going to do is we're going to get some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip. And we are going to vigorously scrub that ink off of that clear label and it's actually really cool because um, after you're done this kind of adds a protective coating to the front of your label um, but honestly guys you got to put some elbow grease into this and it took me about 15 minutes but eventually I got it then it was time to uh, move on to this permanent marker here on the back of the cartridge so let's see what we can do with that shall we We're going to take a little bit of alcohol on a Q-tip, and we're going to do the same process, guys. We're just going to scrub our little hearts out. Now, this took me about, I'm going to say, 10 to 15 minutes as well. So this is really time-consuming, but it's so worth it in the end. Look sharp, guys. Look at that. Next, we're going to get some Goo Gone here, and we are just going to scrub all of the excess sticker residue off of this entire cartridge, and it's really going to sharpen it up and make it look super clean, guys. This stuff works amazing. There we have it. She is clean and ready to go. Now, what we're going to do is um, we're going to grab these one-up type cartridge cleaners here. We're going to get some alcohol. And uh, there's one side of this that you add the alcohol to. It's labeled the wet side, so that is super convenient. You're going to take the alcohol, put it on there, and then you're going to scrub away. 
Make sure to get pretty even coats on both sides of the uh, cartridge pins there. Then you're going to take this dry side, guys, and you're going to do the same thing. Pretty self-explanatory, very easy to use, and uh, these are good for about 150 cartridges or so, so they're going to last you a minute. Well, there you have it, guys. My Pokemon Snap is all shined up and ready to play. Now, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I hope this video was super helpful for you guys, and I hope that you uh, found a couple useful tips and tricks to use during your retro video game collecting journey. Well, this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What's going on Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I wanted to go over all of the amazing pickups that we got in the month of July. Now um, this pickups video is going to be a little bit lighter than most. We had a couple things going on at the house this month that really uh, brought us back as far as the retro video game collecting goes. Uh, we got a new AC put in, some stuff like that. But no worries guys, because we still picked up some super sweet stuff, some uh, really rare and awesome items. And I can't wait to show them to you. So if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without further ado guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, the first thing we picked up in the month of July is uh, a super rare item I've been looking for for a long time. And here it is guys. You recognize that? Yes, that is the uh, Nintendo Game Boy Player for the GameCube. And uh, it's a super rare hard find. Um, you can come across them every now and then. but. Uh, what you can't usually come across is the startup disc. Um, I found this on Facebook in Columbus and I was so excited when I saw that it came with this uh, startup disc. But uh, I got a solid deal on it. Um, it actually came with one, two, three, four games, guys. Came with some solid stuff here Scooby Doo and the Cyber Chase for the Game Boy Advance. Um, it came with Scooby-Doo Unmasked for the Game Boy Advance as well. And then this is a combo with Scooby-Doo Cyber Chase and Scooby-Doo Mystery Mayhem all on one cartridge. So I thought that was pretty cool too. And last but not least, it came with the uh, Namco Pac-Man collection. So that's super fun. But yeah guys, I thought that was really neat. And uh, I picked it up for a steal. I got the Game Boy Player, the disc, and all of those games for 50 bucks. And uh, I'm sure as some of you know that you can uh, barely find the disc for that price sometimes. So, felt like I got a remarkable deal on it. Now the next thing that I picked up in the month of July, um, it actually came with Super Mario Maker 2. And it was this lunchbox. Now, this lunchbox was an exclusive that uh, Target would give out to you when you bought Super Mario Maker 2, and um, they went really fast. I'm sure some of you guys are aware, but uh, yeah, they all sold out immediately, and the lunchboxes were fetching upwards of $150 on eBay after that. So it had actually been a couple, uh, couple weeks after the release of Super Mario Maker 2, and a couple of my buddies and I had stumbled into the Target on East Washington Street. And I just so happened to go up to the guy and I, you know, at behind the counter at the electronics desk. And I asked him, I said, hey man, do you guys have any of those lunch boxes still? And it was just so miraculous. He actually had two of them. So not only do I have that one, but I have a sealed copy as well. Very nice stuff, super awesome guys. It has a 
this cool Super Mario Maker 2 sticker here on the back. But yeah, it was super neat. I'm really glad that I found it. Well, there you have it, guys. This concludes our pickups video for the month of July. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you're interested to see more about that Game Boy player, stay tuned to my channel for the weeks to come because I'm going to be doing a, uh, an informational video on it, and it's definitely going to be worth checking out. So, if you like what you saw here today, guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. And, uh... I don't, if you guys noticed, I have been repping my new Outlaw Bits Gaming t-shirt. I'm going to go ahead and drop the uh, Teespring link in the description below, and if you guys are interested, feel free to pop in and represent that Outlaw Bits Gaming gear. Well, this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on guys? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we are chilling at Gen Con 2019 Indianapolis waiting in line waiting for some tickets. Alrighty guys, uh, I went to Gen Con this year with my buddies Jed and Brad, and this is some footage of us just sitting in the lines there waiting. This is us uh, wandering the halls, and I was following the uh, melody of some beautiful music I heard, and I eventually stumbled upon these guys. They were playing songs from your favorite video game and anime titles, and uh, they were taking donations for songs, so it was really cool. Really, really cool. Then we entered the main hall. I was blown away, guys. This has been my first Gen Con, and uh, this is essentially where everybody meets to play the board games. Uh, we got a lot going on here. I passed the Pokemon trading card game booth, and they had the most awesome Pokemon shirts I had ever seen. I was making my way to this giant inflatable Pikachu that was impossible to miss and super cool. After that we had our fill of the uh, board game room and it was time to enter the exhibit hall where we oh saw these goodness. amazing miniatures. They are super detailed and just stunning. It's astonishing the amount of work and detail that went into these minis. Look at that orb, super far out, dude. But yeah, they're models that you can assemble, and they were for a specific game, but I just thought they were really neat and had to show them. This is a uh, giant miniature, <laughs> if you will, that was out, out front of the booth. This is the uh, Square Enix booth. And uh, they had the Tomb Raider video game going on. I thought that was pretty cool. Tomb Raider board game. After that, I stumbled upon this awesome booth that sold um, 3D video game inspired pictures. So it'll take the scene from your, your favorite video game and kind of makes it 3D. It's really cool, dude. Super different. There's a Majora's Mask one there I absolutely loved. There's a Deku uh, tree and Link there. And then I ran into some awesome anime figurines. I uh, love checking these out anywhere I run into them. And uh, I was not disappointed with the selection. That little Goku on a stick was my favorite there. Super cool. We uh, ran into this really interesting blockbuster stand. They were selling board games. It was interesting to see. Um, of course, there's some amazing artists. There was a Sailor Moon inspired picture down there that caught my eye, so I had to check out their booth. But uh, Gen Con is full of amazing artists, and this was one of them. So yeah, really neat. And the moment I had been waiting for, 
I stumbled upon the only video game booth at Gen Con, and I could not have been happier that I did. They had the uh, Ghosts and Goblins for the Sega there. They have uh, Zombies Ate My Neighbors in box for the Sega. Lots of in box Super Nintendo games as well, which uh, I was super excited about. They had the PlayStation there, the Power Pad, and the Action Set in box. Super impressive. They had some uh, Japanese imports. And for the Holy Grail, they had a boxed Zelda and the highest graded Little Samson. So that was truly remarkable. And I can't tell you enough how in complete utter awe I was. I would never pay that for a game, but it is really impressive. What is going on guys? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be doing a brief overview and demonstration of the Super Game Boy Player. Now I'm super excited to be bringing you guys this demonstration. I uh, picked this up last month for one of my monthly pickups and just couldn't be happier to show you guys the ins and outs of it. So if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado guys, let's get right into it. The year was 1994, and a serious epidemic was sweeping throughout this great nation. 90s kids everywhere were in desperate search of a way to utilize their recently acquired Game Boy games on their home televisions. Luckily for them, Nintendo would answer those cries in June of that year, indefinitely changing the way that we view handheld video game consoles and how we port them over to our home theater systems forever. In June 1994, Nintendo released the Super Game Boy for the Super Famicom system in Japan and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System here in the West. This allowed kids and adults alike to experience playing their favorite Game Boy Color and Game Boy games on the TV screen like never before. Using real Game Boy hardware inside the cartridge, the Super Game Boy was undoubtedly the best way to experience some of the most classic Game Boy games on the Super Nintendo. But alas, a short two years after the Super Game Boy hit the store shelves, the next generation of consoles would be ready to hit the homes of consumers. The Nintendo 64 was released to the public. Folks searching for a way to play these treasured Game Boy games on the Nintendo 64 would unfortunately be severely let down until Nintendo introduced the Transfer Pack as an official Nintendo 64 add-on with the release of Pokemon Stadium in 1999. The main goal of the transfer pack was simple. It gave players the opportunity to transfer the Pokemon that they had caught during the adventures in Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow onto Pokemon Stadium for use in battle and much, much more. If the player inserts their Pokemon game pack into the transfer pack while playing Pokemon Stadium, the player may also utilize the Game Boy Tower. The Game Boy Tower is essentially a Game Boy emulator buried within the N64 that allows players to enjoy their handheld Pokemon games on the comforts of a big screen. The transfer pack doesn't run off the original Game Boy hardware like the Super Game Boy, so you can only play Pokemon titles while using the transfer pack with Pokemon Stadium. Though there are a handful of other games that utilize the transfer pack's capabilities, you can't physically play the other titles through the console, leaving the Game Boy transfer pack laying flat on its face when compared to the Super Game Boy and leaving customers no way to play the vast majority of their favorite Game Boy titles on the Nintendo 64. Players would have to retreat back to the closet and pull out their old SNES if they wanted to relive some nostalgia from their childhoods and play some of those old Game Boy games. That is, until Nintendo decided to release a remarkable and sensible add-on for their up-and-coming console, the Nintendo GameCube. And in 2003, 
we were graciously introduced to one of the best peripherals for the GameCube system, the Game Boy Player, which is going to be our main focus on today's video. The Game Boy Player was a truly remarkable addition to the GameCube's arsenal and allowed gamers to play all of their original Game Boy and Game Boy Color as well as their Game Boy Advance games in one convenient piece of hardware. The Game Boy Player utilized all of the inner workings of a Game Boy Advance, making this peripheral super reliable and ensuring that a majority of the titles would work flawlessly on the system. The Game Boy Player worked by connecting an add-on to the bottom of the GameCube using the high-speed parallel port located on the far left corner of the system. The Game Boy Player also has two flathead screws that help securely hold the Game Boy Player to the bottom of the GameCube. Aside from that, there's a game slot, obviously for inserting your favorite Game Boy games of choice. It comes fitted with an external extension out connection for Game Boy link cables, wireless adapters and the like, and it comes equipped with this intriguing eject button, and like the name suggests, it literally ejects your game from the Game Boy player. With great force, I might add. It was quite impressive to be honest. The Game Boy player comes with a startup disc. You'll need the startup disc to play any Game Boy games on the console. And while the console add-on is a region free, meaning that you can play any Game Boy game using a Game Boy player from Japan or any other region, the startup disc is a region specific, meaning that you'll have to have an American startup disc to play your favorite Game Boy titles on your US GameCube system. And while finding the Game Boy player itself is not so difficult out there in the wild, tracking down the startup disc can prove to be a challenging feat and can cost you the upwards of $75 US. Moving on to the software capabilities of the Game Boy Player, the system came equipped with a few standalone features that worked hand in hand with the games being played on screen. The first feature is the frame selection. This allows players to choose one of 20 frames to surround their game of choice. The second selection in the Game Boy Player's menu is screen size allowing you to choose between normal or full size display when playing your favorite Game Boy titles, which is a bit larger than the normal setting. The next feature of the Game Boy Player is a controller setting which allows you to change the function to the button layout of the GameCube's controller. Not completely necessary, but interesting nonetheless and kind of useful. The fourth feature down the line is the screen filter selection, which allows you to choose between three different screen filters. The first filter is Soften, which makes the pixels a bit less intense. Then there's a Normal filter, which keeps the picture the same quality. And finally, the Sharpen filter that makes those pixels slightly more crisp for a better viewing experience, though it doesn't make that much of a difference and it's hard to tell. The fifth selection in the Game Boy Player's interface is a Timer function. The user can set a timer between 1 and 60 minutes for any reason that they see fit from limiting play times to keeping track of those savory batch of chicken nuggets you have in the oven for a truly optimal gaming experience. The final selection on the Game Boy Player is the Change Game Packs function, which allows users to safely change out their Nintendo Game Boy games of choice while the system is still up and running without damaging the hardware. Getting tired of a game you're playing? shoot over to the change game packs function and pop that sucker out using the state-of-the-art ejector button that we discussed earlier. Then, put the new game you wish to play inside the cartridge slot and you are ready to go. Now with all that out of the way, I'm ready to get playing, guys. Well, there you have it, guys. This has been my brief demo and uh, overview of the Nintendo Game Boy Player for the GameCube. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope that it was super informative for you. Now, if you like what you saw here today, guys, don't be afraid to smash that like button at the bottom of the page, and be sure to click subscribe and ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be doing a brief overview and demonstration of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the Nintendo GameCube. Now if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. 
I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and without further ado, let's get right into it. Released in the US for the GameCube on February 11, 2002, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle was a surprisingly astonishing game that propelled the Sonic franchise into the homes and the hearts of millions of Nintendo fans around the world. Starting out as an upgraded port of the original Dreamcast version, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the GameCube captivated audiences and gamers' attention with its truly stunning display of graphics, fast-paced gameplay, and its intriguingly deep storyline. Sonic Adventure 2 Battle had all of the elements of a hit game neatly crammed into one amazingly packaged port for the GameCube. The story starts out with everybody's favorite, lovable hedgehog protagonist leaping from a helicopter to escape military forces who are mistakenly searching for a less than identical hedgehog by the name of Shadow. Shadow is a secret weapon developed by the late Gerald Robotnik and revived by his grandson, Dr. Eggman, during the events of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Driven by revenge for his lost companion, Maria, Shadow agrees to help Eggman take over the world and find the lost Chaos Emeralds. These emeralds are needed to power an Eclipse cannon mounted on top of the Space Colony Ark, and it's Sonic and the crew's job to stop Eggman and his counterparts from finding these emeralds and destroying the world as we know it. The gameplay for this title is truly one of a kind in a way that it allows the player to choose between a playthrough of the Heroes campaign or the Dark campaign, allowing the player to experience both sides of the story from an alternate perspective. The Hero side allows you to play through the adventures of Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles on their quest to thwart Eggman and his accomplices. The dark side lets the player experience the tale through the eyes of Shadow, Eggman, and a new addition to the Sonic universe, the Dark Bat Rouge. The main story features three major kinds of game modes depending on which character the player is using. Sonic and Shadow's levels are generally fast-paced action platformer levels that focus on obtaining vast amounts of rings and reaching the finish line. As for Tails and Eggman, their levels typically consist of action shooter elements and generally have the player controlling a mechanized suit as they wreak havoc on enemy robots and boxes alike with some serious firepower, receiving periodic upgrades for their weapons and suits as the player progresses through the story, as well as a few hidden upgrades stashed along the way. And lastly, Knuckles and Rouge take the lead in some challenging platformer adventure type levels with a heavy focus on exploration. Typically taxed with hunting down the shards of the Chaos Emeralds, these levels can prove to be quite challenging and super fun. The game features a two-player mode with a few extra additions that make the game fantastic to play with friends. The first mode is an action race that involves racing head-to-head -head with your buddy to get to the goal ring first. The second game is a treasure hunt that puts you and a friend at odds trying to score yourself two pieces of the Chaos Emerald hidden within some of your favorite maps from the game. The third is a shooting challenge where the goal is to reduce your compadre's life bar all the way down to zilch to steal the crown in this epic bout. A secret kart racing minigame can be unlocked simply by playing through the both the hero and dark side campaigns and completing the Route 101 level on the hero side and the Route 280 level on the dark side. Well worth the trouble and a super fun addition to the game. Periodically, on the player's travels to find those Chaos Emeralds, and among their box-smashing frenzy, they might stumble upon a Chow Key. This magnificent little blue key transports the player to the single-handedly most amazing portion of this entire game, in my opinion. The place where you'll spend countless hours of your time. Upon obtaining the Chow Key, and completing the current level in which the player found that key, they will then be transported to the Chow Garden where they will stumble upon two eggs lying in the middle of a garden oasis. Once these eggs hatch, you'll be introduced to your new Chow companion. And once your heart stops overflowing with unsurmountable joy, you'll be able to interact with the cute little buggers in a variety of interesting ways. You'll need to feed them, raise them, and harness their skills as they grow. To feed them, head on over to the nearest palm tree and shake the holy hell out of that thing. 
Eventually, some fruit will drop off and you can fill the belly of that cute new friend you found. During your adventures through the levels, you'll have surely noticed the floating tubes that drop upon defeating an enemy. These tubes can be brought back to the Chow Garden and then fed to the Chows to increase their skills. These skills can be used to give your Chow an advantage in a number of races and karate championships to test their true skills, and not to mention scoring sweet trophies and prizes for your Chow. Now there's a lot to cover in the Chow Garden, so I'm only going to touch on it briefly in this video, but I plan on doing an entirely separate video on the matter because it is so extensive. Well there you have it guys. This has been my brief demo and overview of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the Nintendo GameCube. Now if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and I hope that this video was super informative for you guys. Well, this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and it's that time again guys. We're going to be going over our pickups for the month of August. I honestly can't believe that it already came and went, but we've got some sick stuff to show you guys and I just couldn't be more excited to do it. If you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty, guys, so let's get right into it. Um, the first thing that I got here is a really awesome collectible that my girlfriend actually got me and um, it is the Legend of Zelda Electronic Ocarina of Time it is super cool it comes with this instructional booklet as well as a song book um, it comes with an awesome pedestal stand for your ocarina to sit on thought that was super neat and uh, basically what this is it's an electronic ocarina and if you play a series of notes on here, uh, basically the same ones from the N64 games and the like, it will play them for you. It'll play the entire song. So, for instance... Play that series of notes. We've got the Song of Time! Yeah! Pretty cool, guys. I absolutely love it. It's a nice little addition to the collection. Really thankful that she got it for me. Um, like I said, there's a lot. There's a lot of awesome art inside this book. I found really cool. There is the song list that lets you play some of your most favorite beloved songs from The Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time. Pretty cool. Another collectible that I got this month that was super sick and I loved was uh, this little plush stuffed Luigi. Thought that was super nice and um, Laura found this at a Goodwill. She is awesome at thrifting and finds the coolest of finds. I think I'm going to put this on top of my uh, video game shelving here where my Robot Rob and a couple of my higher end uh, sealed games sit. So yeah, he's got a special home. Another thing that she found me while she was Goodwill hunting this month was this awesome Super Mario Roulette game. You hit the top here, it spins, and lets you know if you're a winner. And more times than not, you are. I'm going to say it's rigged in your favor. <laughs> but yeah, super cool little addition. It says on the side here that this was a McDonald's toy, and I find that super interesting. I don't go around getting kids meals all the time, so it's really cool when we find stuff like this. She probably paid like 50 cents for it, so super good deal. The next game that I got here is uh, one that I picked up at the Disc Replay on East Washington Street, and it's one that I've been looking for to add back to my collection for a long time. Um, I had a copy, but I don't anymore. And 
that is Animal Crossing, the original. So I'm, uh, I'm going for a complete set of Animal Crossing games. This is the player's choice, I know, but I needed it anyway. So had to pick it up, guys. And for $15.99, that is a solid deal that I could not pass up. Now uh, I'm ready to play. The very last thing that I picked up in the month of August here was a really awesome find, to be honest, and that is the Legend of Zelda Collector's Edition promotional disc, not for resale. So basically what this is, guys, is this was a promotional bundle that came with the GameCube, and um, it's a Zelda game that offers four original Zelda titles. There's a little uh, artwork here on the inside. Thought that was super cool to still have. We're missing the manual, but we'll find it, boys. Don't worry. Um, this game actually, it includes the original Legend of Zelda for the NES, Legend of Zelda 2 Adventures A Link for the NES, um, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for the N64, as well as, uh, as uh, Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. And it also has a couple promotional videos on there that I thought were super cool. And uh, if you have time, you got to watch them, guys. Super neat stuff. But yeah, coming up in the weeks to follow on my channel, I'm actually going to be doing an in-depth analysis of this game and uh, talking about some of the ins and outs of it. So that's super cool. Well, there we have it, guys. I showed you all the uh, six stuff that I picked up in the month of August, and uh, I even showed you how to play the ocarina. Yeah! Now, uh, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Now, be sure to click in. If you're watching this right now, we are currently at Comic-Con, Indiana 2019, and next week... I'm going to be having a video talking all about it, guys. An overview, a tour, a walkthrough. It's going to be amazing. So be sure to stay tuned for that. Now, uh, don't forget to tune in to Outlaw Bits Gaming for more awesome retro video game content. And this has been Kerr Stevens, signing off. What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bids Gaming. We out ya. Indiana Comic Con 2019. What you know? Alrighty guys, so we started our uh, Comic-Con journey by walking to the convention center. See the Miss Lovely Laura there in her Kiki outfit. She looks so wonderful. She put a lot of time into that. Really good. And then we entered the convention hall. This is us uh, walking up to get our badges and whatnot. We saw some really cool cosplayers as we were walking in, and then after we got our badges, it was time to enter the exhibit hall, guys. When I walked in here, I was absolutely blown away. There were so many people cosplaying today, and it was just amazing to see. Um, the stars were over here to the left doing autographs, and I just, I love it, guys. The first stand we walked up on was this, uh, cat selling these styrofoam weapons and they are so cool he had a lot of interesting masks some oni masks he had some uh, gears of war guns and key blades he had loki's helmet there as well as captain america and batman so i thought that was super awesome over here he had some more just generic type masks but they were super cool had the black plague mask there some uh, styrofoam shields and of course some awesome swords very sweet 
Why my buddy Jed was uh, getting John Marston's autograph, I ran into this awesome R2-D2 and had to go check him out. He makes some awesome sound effects, and uh, it was just overall neat to see. This is that really cool stuff you run into at conventions. I like it a lot. And I finally stumbled across a retro game uh, dealer here at Comic-Con. He had all sorts of stuff. He had collectibles from anything you could think of. He had some Gundam stuff down there. Um, he had some old Super Mario DVDs, some Star Trek stuff there. Super solid, guys. I came over here and uh, found a Game Boy, um, a Game Boy Advanced, and then a limited edition Game Boy Color, the Pokemon edition. Super cool. Got some more general collectibles here, toys and whatnot. Over here we have the 25th anniversary Wii. We have Pac-Man lunch boxes. I thought that was super nice as well. We've got a few uh, odds and end game cubes up here as well as an Atari system. A plethora of NES consoles. We've got some Star Wars toys over here guys and uh, yeah this was hot spot games and collectibles. I was super happy the guy was uh, cool with this filming. There he is talking to Laura. And then we stumbled across uh, Artist Alley. Found a lot of good art. I was absolutely in love with that Bulma painting. And uh, I'm kind of sad I didn't bite the bullet on that one and get it. But yeah, we saw a lot of interesting stuff, guys. We met the co-creator of Rin and Stimpy and uh, saw some of his artwork and I was completely and utterly amazed. It was super cool and he was a really interesting character. I sat and listened to him talk for a spell. That was so fun. Then I ran into another uh, retro video game booth and they had custom Game Boys as well as an extensive library of imports which I thought was super cool. Here's a lot of uh, Super Famicom games and the like. We found this really awesome Sailor Moon R Super Famicom game and uh, it was sealed in box. Laura loved that. We have the uh, original Pokemon Stadium there, Japanese version. We've got the Game Boy Color, the region free games of course. Thought that was super cool. Got a Dragon Ball Z one there. And then uh, stepping around the corner, we've got some plushies, obviously, a convention must. We have some GameCube controllers there, looks like some custom boys. and. Uh, we have the Hori Gamepad, guys, for the N64. Whopping $120, but we've got him. He had some standard American NES console uh, cartridges as well. He had some that were modded to play both English and Japanese version games, so I thought that was really neat. Looks like we have a... Uh sealed Japanese Hey You Pikachu in box. That's super interesting. And theirs actually came with a headset, which I was surprised about. Really interesting to learn. He had a couple grab bags up there. Moving on to the inside, I stumbled across a Super Famicom I thought was super neat. Had some import PS2 and PS4 games in here, as well as some sealed inbox consoles. Had a lot of Dragon Quest memorabilia, guys. Super awesome stuff. Ran into this booth here, and this guy, um, he made a lot of Perlers. He was actually here last year, and I just gotta say, they stepped their game up by a thousand. Had some tissue boxes there. But just astounding artwork, guys. And we made our Christmas ornaments out of these, so I know the time and perseverance it takes to get these things looking good, and these guys have done a hell of a job. Had that sick Batman and Joker there at the bottom. Had the uh, Legend of Zelda ones I really adored. Had the Windfish there. We ran into this stand that sells maps, your favorite video game maps, and they're actually textured, and they are super cool. I was in love with the one from Zelda, obviously. 
Um, then we ran across this stand that had every single anime statue you could ever think that you wanted. They had so many here, guys. Always fun. Very nice. After that, it was time for us to swing on over to the uh, cosplay contest. And it was just packed in there, guys. Absolutely full. And it was really good to see. Here's a couple of our favorite cosplayers. These uh, Star Wars cats were really cool. That, that It was just really impressive what they had going on. And that they all coordinate together to do this. It was super fun. Now, my favorite cosplayers of the day, obviously, were these Legends of Zelda characters. Um, Tingle, he was absolutely hilarious. And then it was time to see who won for the best cosplayer of 2019 for Indiana Comic Con. I was uh, super happy to have witnessed all of the amazing participants and what they brought to the table. It was fun. After that, we decided to unwind and uh, head over to the arcade and just blow off some steam, guys. It was really neat that they had that set up. All the games were set to free play, so you could basically just walk up to any arcade that you never got the chance to play and play it to your heart's content. So you could basically stick around until you beat it if you wanted to. It was super fun, and I'm glad we got to experience it, guys. Well, there we have it, guys. This concludes our brief tour and overview of the 2019 Indianapolis Comic Con. Now, uh, we saw some really amazing stuff while we were there, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it, and uh, I hope that I could bring that experience to you at home. So, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough again for watching. And this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kirk Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming. And today, we're doing a much anticipated tour of the Outlaw Bits Game Room. So I hope you guys enjoy it, and uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, walking into the game room here, we've got my uh, Master Sword painting I've done. And uh, this is it. This is the Outlaw Bits game room. Been working on this for the better part of a year or so, and uh, couldn't be happier with the way that it's shaping up. Starting to build a pretty good collection. And yeah, today we're going to be doing a tour of it guys, going through the ins and outs. When you first enter the game room here, we have Yuna's staff from Final Fantasy X. And super cool. We made it for Laura to do a cosplay of her last year at Comic-Con, and I absolutely love it. Put a lot of hard time and work and effort into it. Coming over here, we've got Toad, as well as a uh, Sonic Bubble Bath game in Kingdom Hearts 3, on top of my PlayStation 2 display case. Got some heavy hitters there like Futurama, some Harvest Moons. Down here we've got some PS4 games like Sekiro and The Phantom Pain. We've got Legend of the Dragoon and some Final Fantasies down there for you. Some other PS1 classics. Super cool. Here is a, a light that I use during my streams on my backdrop there. Little demonstration of the light in use. Looks super nice. I love it. Good ambiance. Here's the lovely Laura and our cat Katame, chilling on the beanbag. Here to the left we have my uh, Build-A-Bear Pokemon collection, and we've been slowly trying to get all of these. Um, we're still searching for the Aloean Vulpix, but yeah, we have a few more to get to complete the collection, but I love them, guys. Here on the right side of my entertainment stand, we've got my box N64. We've got a few uh, Wii and Switch titles, as well as some DS there. Here we have my prize GameCube collection. Got Animal Crossing, Metal Gear Solid, Sonic, 
some heavy hitters in there. Here we have some Mario Kart McDonald's toys that Laura found for me. Goodwillin', and I love them. We've got my uh, collection of NES games down here, ever growing. We got some heavy hitters in here too. We've got Zeldas, of course. We've got Star Tropics, Metal Gears. We've got uh, um, Donkey Kongs. We've got Mario's, all the good stuff. Here's a game that I created for the NES called Adventures of Eldarin and a book that Laura made me for Valentine's Day. Here we have a PlayStation 2 with the PSI. On top of my entertainment stand here we have my vast Game Boy collection with my Game Boy printers, my original Game Boys, my Game Boy Colors, my Game Boy Pockets. We've got the Pokemon Plus Ball for Let's Go Eevee. Up top here we've got a uh, box Super Scope, some in-box games like my Legend of Zelda there, my Robot Rob Deluxe set. Here to the left we've got our Princess Peach DS lunchbox. We've got the Sega Nomad in the Game Gear here. I love having them in the collection. Here we have uh, some of my favorite imports on display. Got Kirby's and uh, Zelda Ocarina of Time. We have a repro cart of uh, Sculptor's Cut back there. On this next shelf here we've got some Let's Go Eevees and uh, Pikachus. One of them sealed in box. We've got some Amiibos here, as well as the collectible Mario Odyssey um, cereal. So yeah, super nice. Down here we have my DVD collection. I've got uh, all the seasons of Dragon Ball, as well as the movies there. The Legend of Zelda DVD set and uh, the Pokemon VHS, a have to have. We have my uh, video game literature down here. We've got code books. We've got D&D &D books. Down here we've got a remote control Mario. I absolutely love that guy down there. Super cool. Underneath the entertainment stand is where I uh, keep my game consoles here. Most of them come equipped with dust covers like the NES and the uh, Super Nintendo there. Got the GameCube, the PlayStation 1, and the PlayStation 2 Slim. We've got these Nintendo 64 storage cabinets as well as my limited edition gold PlayStation 4. Here's another one of those cabinets that holds the uh, N64 games, guys, as you're about to see here. Going to open her on up, and uh, yeah, I think it holds 24 games, so super cool. And it's actually from the 90s. I love these things. The one on the right side here houses my Super Nintendo games. I have more in my bedroom as well, but this is the uh, bulk of the collection. You can see Star Fox there, got some uh, Earthbound and such. Coming down the wall here, we've got some sealed inbox games like The Empire Strikes Back there. We've got some uh, boxes on display like that Game Genie box. And then we've got Sonic the Hedgehog 2 for the Game Gear sealed, the Total Recall box, and Madden 2002 sealed in box. Pretty cool. Here is an uh, overview display of the entire entertainment stand. And uh, I'm just so excited that I finally got to show you guys this. Here is my game chair. Come equipped with my Legend of Zelda hat that I wear during streams. Let's get it, guys. To the left of the entertainment stand, we have some more storage for uh, some NES controllers here. We've got the dog bone there on top, as you can see. Oh yeah. Down here we've got some more with a custom skin on this NES controller I'm absolutely in love with. I thought that was super neat. Here we've got my Wii Tower that was graciously donated by my friend Kyle, YouTuber the Indiana Man. And then inside the closet here, we've got some cord and controller storage, a must-have for any game room. Let's dig into it. <laughs> it is a mess, guys. Organization is not the key in this game room. <laughs> we've got some more Game Boy Colors there, as well as a handy pack. We've got some more controller storage here, my N64 controllers there with transfer pack very nice got some more in here and then uh, I keep my PlayStation stuff on the very bottom here so yeah moving on over here 
we have uh, a lot of handheld, some old school handheld games, as well as this tele-action TV game on display. We've got the Goku Kamehameha Blaster there, some DS boxes. Down here we've got the Pelican GameCube uh, display rack, as well as some Dragon Ball Z Scouters. We've also got some um, Digimon little pocket games there, super neat. Here we have my Intellivision 2, neatly displayed in that case. Below that we have my Atari 2600 and a CRTV to play them on, guys, for those old school classics. To the left here we have the Atari Flashback that was given to me by my friend Jared. We've got the Super Mario Maker 2 sealed lunchbox, as well as some Nintendo Power and uh, instruction manual literature from games. Here in the entryway, we have these awesome off-brand um, Nintendo Pops. They're called Clicks, and they're super cool. We got these as a part of a video game lot, and I absolutely love them. They're, they're just so neat. We got Donkey Kong, we got Mario, and then we got Link at the top. Here's a better view of the backdrop, and uh, if you guys watch my videos, you have seen this quite a bit. Got my Legend of Zelda Wind Waker um, backdrop there with Majora's Mask. Here we've got the Nintendo GameCube store sign, as well as the Sega CD sign. And if uh, we move down from there, we have the Snorlax beanbag chair. A must-have for relaxing here in the game room after a hard day of filming. Well, there you have it guys. This concludes my uh, 2019 video game room tour. If you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching. And this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on guys? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be doing a uh, review of The Lynx Awakening, newly released for the Nintendo Switch. So buckle up your seatbelts guys because this is going to be awesome. Alrighty guys, let's get right into it. So Link's Awakening is a uh, truly amazing game. I picked it up on launch day, um, September 20th, from GameStop in Shelbyville, Indiana. I got there exactly when they opened. They had to uh, open up the gates and the doors for this guy. I was so excited. Um, I missed my pre-order for the Dreamers Edition, but that's okay guys. We're steadfast and uh, trying to hunt it down. But yeah, I absolutely love this game, guys. If you've been watching my channel, you know that uh, over the past few weeks, I've been doing a run-through of Link's Awakening DX for the Game Boy. And it's a truly remarkable game as well. It's, it's super difficult and challenging, um, especially for a Game Boy game. And I like that a lot. But I did all that in preparation for the launch of Link's Awakening for the Switch here, and uh, I'm really happy I did it to say the least. It was really awesome um, seeing the differences between the two games, not only graphics wise, but story and dialogue wise, little extra things that they threw in there on the Switch version. It was truly remarkable. The dungeons, the dungeons are so great. Uh, they gradually get more difficult as you go. And it's really important to ease the player into it. But by the end, man, I am telling you, the 7th and 8th dungeon, they kick my ass. They are rough. I just got done playing it on uh, the Game Boy, and you would have thought that I would have been well attuned and, and adjusted to it. But no, that is not the case. When I got to Link's Awakening, the 7th and 8th dungeon gave me just as much trouble. It's like I never played them at all. But yeah, guys, it's a super fun game. The graphics on it are truly remarkable. I love the uh, chibi style that they went with on this one. I thought that was super neat. It's a very unique style for a Zelda game, uh, but I'm excited to see more of it. 
I'd like to see them uh, remake some other Game Boy games, possibly on that engine. I think that would be super cool. So yeah, guys, the graphics are beautiful. Uh, can't say anything else about that. They're just they're truly remarkable. I love the way that the story progresses on here, and uh, I love just just like I said, subtle changes between the Game Boy and the Switch version. Um, when you're traveling around doing the the trading missions. You'll eventually meet a goat in the animal village, and uh, if you give her a hibiscus flower, she will give you a letter for Mr. Wright. And <laughs> she's basically catfishing him, man. When you go and get a letter to Mr. Wright, he looks at it, and it's uh, it's a picture. It's a picture of Princess Peach. Totally not what he was expecting, huh? But yeah, I thought that was super interesting. That was one of the, my most uh, favorite moments in the entire game seeing him get catfished and the difference between that and uh, the Game Boy version and the Switch version is that in the Game Boy version the photo actually says Christine Peach on the bottom now I think they deliberately took that out on this uh, version not to get any canonical names messed up or anything like that but it's still an interesting fact that it was changed in the Switch version. thought that was cool. Um, I picked the Link's Awakening up launch day, like I said, at GameStop. Uh, I was there as soon as they opened, so for pre-ordering the game there, I got this amazing Link's Awakening poster. Yeah, get some good, uh, good views there. So you guys check that out. Super awesome stuff. And if you guys aren't familiar with this game, uh, the storyline is amazing. You are tasked as a Link who has been stranded on the island of Colent to find the eight sacred instruments of the island to wake the windfish. And it's just, the premise of it is so neat, guys. It's uh, definitely outside the box and very interesting to say the least. Um, you travel around dungeon to dungeon, defeating enemies and trying to secure the instruments. And it's just, it's super fun, guys. You gotta go pick it up. Well, there you have it, guys. This has been my uh, thoughts and review on The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening for the Nintendo Switch. Now, I highly suggest you guys going and getting yourself a copy and uh, playing it today. It's super fun, guys. Definitely worth it. If you like what you saw here today, guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on guys? It's Kerr Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today we're gonna to be going over all of the games that I picked up in the month of September. Now, uh, be sure to stay tuned, guys, because we've got a lot of good pickups this month that I can't wait to show you guys. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so the first thing that we picked up in the month of September stretches all the way back to the beginning of the month, September 1st, on the last day of Comic-Con. And that is my sealed in-box Game Boy cleaning kit. Um, we were walking around Comic-Con and one of the smaller video game booths there had uh, actually quite a variety of some sealed games. And when I saw this Game Boy cleaner here, I just... I knew I had to add it to the collection. Um, I've got a lot of other in-box Game Boys, and it uh, it fit perfect on the shelf next to them. So yeah, guys, I was super excited about picking that up. Ooh, now the next game that I got in the month of September, about halfway through the month or so, 
uh, Miss Laura and I were walking around the exchange on East Washington Street and found Xenoblade Chronicles for the Wii. I was so excited to add this to the collection, guys. I've actually been looking for it for uh, quite some time. And um, I even got the first print edition with uh, the Wii here on the inside of the box. If it says Nintendo, it's a second edition for sure. Um, but yeah, pretty cool stuff. I was super excited to add it to the collection, like I said. Now, on uh, September 20th, I know you guys tuned in to my 12-hour live stream of Link's Awakening. Um, I was super excited to get this too. I had uh, spent the, the rest of the month playing Link's Awakening DX on the Game Boy, kind of bracing myself for this game to come out. And when it did, I was so excited, guys. I had so much fun playing it, and I actually beat it in one sitting. Um, during my live stream... It was actually like 13 hours long instead of 12, and I got her done, guys. We uh, woke that wind fish. So yeah, that was super cool. Uh, but I pre-ordered it from GameStop. So I also got an amazing poster from GameStop. Uh, if you saw my Link's Awakening review video, you will have already seen this, but yeah. That was a super cool pickup, but I'm actually going to get a frame for this one. I thought it was super neat, and I've got to keep it preserved, guys. But I was disheartened when I got uh, Link's Awakening for the Switch because I had missed the pre-order for the Dreamers Edition. And I called around every GameStop after launch day to see if they had extras. Some did, but were waiting on people to pick them up and etc. And I didn't think I was going to be able to get one. But uh, luckily, I stayed steadfast and I searched high and low on the Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist every single day, every single night, every break I had during the uh, afternoon. And I finally, finally found The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening Dreamer Edition. I'm super excited, guys. This is still actually sealed in box. It has not been opened yet. And I think as of right now, I'm going to keep it that way. Um, I'm kind of at an impasse right now and struggling with, with what to do there. Because I want to see the art inside this beautiful art book. But yeah, guys, super excited that I finally tracked this down. Uh, got it from a guy off the Facebook Marketplace, like I said, and I couldn't be happier to find it. Um, he actually, he had this. And then he also... Had the pre-ordered edition of the Link's Awakening Amiibo. Another hard-to-find item, guys. They sold out super fast. So, I'm just ecstatic to have this in my collection as well. Uh, it is super cool. He's a cute little guy. Um, you can actually use him through the plastic, so I'm going to keep him sealed in box. But, uh, yeah. He doesn't do anything special on Breath of the Wild. Uh, but he gives you another chamber of dungeons for Link's Awakening here on the Switch. So I thought that was super cool. Last thing I want to do this month, it's not actually a pickup per se, but I want to give a special shout out to a recurring uh, a fan of the YouTube channel. He drops in every live stream and hangs out with us. He comes every Friday and watches our uh, uploads. And this week... He actually let me borrow his 3DS so I could play some of these uh, 3DS titles that I've been collecting as of late. So, I want to give a special shout out to Tom Squindiddly. Um, that's his YouTube account name, and he is a super cool cat. And I just wanted to say thank you again, man, for letting me borrow this. I've been tearing Animal Crossing up since you gave it to me. So, there we go. Well, there you have it, guys. That wraps up my pickups for the month of September. We got some pretty solid stuff this month. And uh, I really hope you guys enjoyed seeing what we got. Now if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Thank you guys so much for watching. And this has been Kurt Stevens, signing off.
How's it going guys? This is the lovely Laura here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be doing an unboxing of the Nintendo Switch Lite. Without further ado, let's get right into it. How's it going guys? It is the lovely Laura here with a unboxing of a Nintendo Switch Lite that my awesome babe got me for my birthday which was actually yesterday. Well when you watch this video uh, I'll just pretty much say that it was on October 7th so <laughs> I was turning the nice old 25 and yeah this needless to say this was a really nice surprise so Let's get right into it. All right. You just want to take a look here. Oh, God, I can't wait. <laughs> All right. So we got, here's our first little loopage. Strappage. It's so crisp. Hmm. It's basically just telling you to plug it in before you, I mean, yeah, before you start. That's cute. Yeah, and on, and on another flap they give you the Nintendo Switch service. Oh, look, oh, look at that. Ooh. Oh, it's so cute, guys. Let's make that look good while it sits there all pretty. Okay, so we kind of have everything all set up here. Here is the actual system itself. Now, let's be real careful with this. Because we want to go get one of those um, nice little shock absorbing clear cases that we want. Because we want to really protect this. Because this is, this is nice. i just put that down there. Oh yeah, that, that feels really, really good. That's, that's gorgeous here. That is lovely. All right. As we get a little more into it, here we got some of the, we have just the basic manual. And looks like next we just have its charger, which I believe looks to be a little bit skinnier than the original that's on the actual Switch. Yeah, everything looks seems to be pretty much the same almost. And honestly, there you have it, guys. I mean, this that's the unboxing of the Switch Lite. We're going to definitely get some, you know, videos of maybe some playage or something like that. You know, we're going to figure it out, you know. Let's see. Oh. I don't like doing that. I don't like hearing those sounds, making those sounds as I do stuff. There we got our game port. It's got, it looks like it kind of has like a silicone coverage here on the inside. I think that's going to be something for like dust preventing whenever you close it. Cause it does give it a really nice like click seal. I really like that. Cause you're going to be taking this to go. So why not? Same with the micro SD slot. Oh, that's pretty dope. Yeah, the speakers on the back look really, really good. I think those are, that's just the air ports on the top of it. Yeah, it has a really good grip. I like that D-pad there. Yeah, these, the controls feel really, really, really good. I like the, the buttons have that nice little, like almost clicky. It just has that good response that you like to hear or like to feel whenever you're clicking a button. It really it makes you feel like you're clicking a button. 
Um, the home and the screenshot have good good feel too. I like the plus and minus have a good feel as well. Um, yeah, charging ports um, on the bottom. I believe was it the same on the switch, the regular switch that it was on the bottom? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But yeah, this seems like. Like it's gonna be a really fun thing to play and stuff like you really can't wait um this was a really oh hello this was a really good gift and i was really really excited that i was able to receive a really nice gift for my 25th birthday and i really want to thank the founder and creator of outlaw bits gaming my baby kurt i absolutely love you sweetheart thank you so much for this well, there you have it, guys. That was the unboxing of the Nintendo Switch Lite. If you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and also hit that notification bell so you can get all up to date with Outlaw Bits Gaming. This has been Lovely Laura with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Hey! <laughs>
So the story of it is really freaking awesome. Very unique, very different. We don't have games out like this anymore. But, uh, but yeah, it's truly great, guys. And back to the level design, it's truly remarkable. Um, some people hate on this game a lot because you'll progress in the story, you'll get another crest, and every time you get a crest, you get a new ability. So with that newfound ability, you might have to travel back to an old level in order to get to a place that you might not have been able to access before or to use that ability to clear a path that was uh, once blocked. So yeah, guys, it's very interesting. It's, it's kind of tedious and a lot of people hate it, but that's what I enjoy about this game. Back in the 90s, when I was a kid just coming up, I mean, that was mind-blowing to me to have that much depth in a video game. So, mad respect on that. Uh, for most of the game, you are in the 2D side-scrolling portion, but actually to travel in between the levels, uh, you, you enter this flying mode, and you can basically fly across the entire map, and you have to hit one of the buttons to kind of glide down into the level that you choose. It's super cool, and there's a lot of things in the map to be discovered. So that's really interesting and uh, it's a lot of fun to go through and try to find some secrets hidden in the map. So yeah guys, that's super cool too. Other than that, it's, it's just a super challenging game. Um, the bosses are going to give you one hell of a time. Uh, you're going to cuss a lot, but it's going to be worth it in the end. It's super cool. Um, the power-ups that you get along the way are honestly really unique, uh, really interesting stuff. The very first one that you get is kind of a ground um, gargoyle power and that crest it gives you the ability to like shoot acid and then it also gives you the ability to dash and uh, when you dash you can dash through statues and stuff like that you can break things. The next crest that you get gives you uh, the ability to fly which is super awesome you're gonna you're gonna need it gives you the ability to fly in the 2D platformer parts of the level, not the level selection part. But yeah, super cool. And then um, one of the last ones that you get during the game is the amphibious, um, the amphibious crest. And obviously it lets you breathe underwater. So, but uh, I absolutely love it guys. And it's one of those really cool games to play during Halloween because it's super spooky and it keeps you on edge the entire time. Very nice stuff. The game also has a password feature if you head over to the main menu and uh, it'll let you get back to the place that you started when you last left off. There's also a few awesome passwords that you can get online. Uh, one is an ultimate password that gives you every single power up. It gives you every single item that you need in the game, and it actually gives you a few bonus levels that were taken out of the game, so that's super cool too. Uh, but yeah, guys, I absolutely love Demon's Crest, and if uh, you're looking for a spooky game to play this holiday season, you better pick her up. It's not going to be cheap. This game costs about 100 bucks, so if you want to try to find some alternative methods of playing it, I completely understand, guys. Well, there you have it, guys. This has been our review of Demon's Crest for the Super Nintendo. And uh, like I said, if you're looking for a spooky game to play this holiday season, you gotta pick it up. Super fun, guys. Um, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Now, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a heads up because on October 31st, we are going to be doing a live stream of Luigi's Mansion 3 on launch day for you guys. So if you're interested, be sure to stop on by to the channel and say hi. Uh, but yeah, that, that'll do it for us, guys. Um, thank you so much for watching Outlaw Bits Gaming. And this has been Kurt Stevens, signing off. What is going on guys? It is Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today I'm going to be doing a review of uh, Luigi's Mansion 3 for the Nintendo Switch. 
Now, I'm super excited to be doing this for you guys today. I know it is uh, Halloween, but when you're seeing this, it's probably going to be the day after. But we went to the old Target this morning and picked her up on launch day. So we have a super exclusive item that I cannot wait to share with you guys. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so I picked up Luigi's Mansion 3 this morning at uh, my local Target here on East Washington Street. And what I've seen so far guys is truly remarkable. The graphics are impeccable on it. Um, they did a really good job bringing it to the Switch and just bringing it to life really. Uh, Luigi's Mansion 3, it, it takes place in a little bit of a different setting than what you're used to. It's not necessarily a mansion, I'll just say that. It's a uh, haunted hotel. But that should be no surprise to some of you if you've been uh, keeping up to date with the news on it. I've been trying to keep myself away from it so I had a fresh outlook when I uh, reviewed the game here. So yeah guys, it's pretty remarkable. Um, I love the way that they introduced Gooigi into the mix. Not only uh, the, the puzzle based when you play by yourself, but the ability to play Luigi's Mansion co-op. I mean that is freaking awesome guys. No point in sugarcoating it here. Um, it's really cool. You can play couch co-op with a friend, or you can play with up to eight people online, which I thought was really impressive how they were able to swing that. Now, I haven't done that yet, but I'm really eager to in the future when a couple of my friends pick up the uh, game, so it's going to be fun. But there's actually a couple more uh, multiplayer uh, levels that you can that you can play with your friends, either on the couch or online as well. And one of them is called the Scare Scraper. And it's basically like a, a, a tower game where you try to beat all the ghosts in the room. You get up to the next floor, if you will. So, yeah, that's pretty neat, I thought. And then uh, there's, another, there's another section called the Scare Park, I believe it was. And it has two mini games in there. Uh, Cannon Barrage and uh, Floating Coin Game. I thought they were pretty fun, too. But... Yeah, guys, it's super awesome. Um, the gameplay, they added a couple things to that, too. They added this uh, like this gust or burst feature for your poltergust. And basically, you can suck up furniture and uh, ghosts, and then you can shoot them away from you. So it adds a little bit more depth to the game, and you can do some pretty cool stuff with that, sucking up furniture and throwing it at enemies and such. But uh, I thought that was cool. And then they also added a, um, a slam feature. When you're sucking up a ghost, you can actually slam it back and forth onto the ground to try to knock its health down a little bit faster. So I thought that was a really cool addition, and it's super helpful because this game is kind of tough, guys. You're going to need it. But, uh, yeah, it's super cool. I, I couldn't say anything else about it. It's a great title. I've been waiting for it to come out for a long time, and uh, I'm super thankful that it came out on Halloween. What more fitting of a day, right? But like I mentioned before, I picked up my copy of Luigi's Mansion at uh, Target on East Washington Street. So I got a couple of goodies that I would love to share with you guys. Now the first thing I got, in the spirit of Halloween, they were giving out a free bag of M&Ms with the purchase of the game. So you know I had to pick these Caramel Boys because they are so good. But uh, yeah, we're looking forward to eating those later on this evening. It's going to be fun. And then, last but not least, the thing I am most excited about that came with Luigi's Mansion, it is a Target exclusive Halloween tote bag. And uh, I guess the premise is, you know, to give it to kids when they buy a game so they can walk around and put their candy in it later tonight. thought that was pretty cool of Nintendo to do. thought it was super awesome. But it's got this awesome uh, Luigi's Mansion not for resale sticker here. Um, it says it's per for promotional use only, so that's pretty cool. And uh, you know I got two of them, so I'm going to keep one of them sealed and tucked away. But we are going to open this one up. 
So let's get right into it, guys. Let's see what she's all about. I don't think that, nope, there's no way to keep the seal intact, and that is fine. Alrighty, let's see what we are working with here. Oh, that is so awesome. That is absolutely amazing, guys. I uh, heard word on the street is that this glows in the dark. We are going to have to test that theory out. But yeah, so that's it. There's a different picture here on the back. He's chasing Luigi. Thought that was pretty cool. Well, there you have it, guys. This has been my review of Luigi's Mansion 3 for the Nintendo Switch. Um, I'm super excited to have uh, been able to bring to you not only what I thought about the game, but a little bit of gameplay footage and as well as that Target exclusive. Uh, it was really cool to be able to show that. So, yeah. If you like what you saw here today, guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough again for watching, and this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kerr Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today we're going to be taking a look at my uh, Wii U kiosk behind me that I picked up in Hope, Indiana. So without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so here it is. I uh, picked up this Wii U kiosk in Hope, Indiana. We found it on the Facebook Marketplace and I got a really good deal on it. Only paid a hundred bucks. So you know I had to swoop down there. Um, here's a little uh, back shot of it. There's the fan port there. My little cat running around. First thing I had to do was to uh, get inside the thing to see what we were working with, so I had to drill out this lock here. Took some time, but we uh, eventually busted on in. We got in there, guys. As you can see here, there's a lot of uh, power blocks that run certain things within the cabinet here. We got the subwoofer there at the bottom. Taking a little closer look, we've got this hub here that um, handles all of the power for the LED lights and different things like that. We've got the Wii U power blocks as well as the uh, sensor block there. Moving on down here, we've got some storage space and another power block for the LEDs, I believe, and the subwoofer here. This thing cranks out some power, guys. After that, I had to uh, dig into the back here because the fan wasn't plugged in. So uh, we had to take these screws out to expose the power block, as you can see here. We had to plug that sucker back up. Everything worked out good. After that, I gave her a quick cleaning, and uh, we were ready to plug her up. And there you have it, guys. There it is, all lit up and ready to go. We've got some Donkey Kong Country playing there on it. Those blue LED lights are so crisp. We've got the uh, nunchuck holders there. Very nice. We've got the blue side panel LEDs you could briefly see there. And uh, yeah, this Wii U backplate. Very solid stuff. Super happy to find this. Moving on down the uh, sides of it here, we have the Super Mario Maker as well as the uh, Pokemon tournament and the Splatoon displays. We've got these beautiful blue LEDs on the side. 
On the top, we have the Paper Mario Color Splash decal. I thought that was super cool, as well as this lit up Wii U light. Very nice. Here we have the uh, lovely Laura's Wii U and the hand controller here all set up and ready to go, lit up with the LEDs. And we've got Donkey Kong rolling, as I said, on the television. We've got some footage of my buddy Brad giving her a try and uh, seeing how she worked. And it worked flawless, guys. Couldn't be happier to add this to the collection, and I was super happy to pick this up. Well, there you have it, Outlaws. This has been my brief uh, tour and inspection of my Wii U kiosk here. Now, you don't see these things every day, so I was super excited to uh, be able to show you guys a little bit of the ins and outs of it. Now, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What is going on guys? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be going over our pickups for the uh, month of October. Now you guys better stay tuned because we picked up some amazing games this month that I cannot wait to show you guys. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so let's get right into it. We've uh, got a lot to cover this month, so we just better get cracking. Now, uh, the first set of stuff I want to go over was donated by a good friend of mine, uh, my buddy Kyle, aka the Indiana Man on YouTube. Go ahead and go check him out. He's got a couple cool things on there. But he donated a vast amount of Wii games to the channel this month, and I couldn't be happier. Um, I got some solid titles here that I need to go over and uh, the first one that I picked up from him was GT Pro Series it's your standard Wii racing game uh, very cool stuff nothing out of the ordinary though uh, we have Mario Kart Wii it's an amazing title I'm sure all of you played it uh, if you had a Wii back in the day when it came out and speaking of that it also came with two steering wheels for the Wii as well. So uh, yeah, we're ready to jam out on some Mario Kart Wii for sure. Oh, now the next the next two games are solid, solid uh, additions to the collection here. And that is Super Mario Galaxy 1 and Super Mario Galaxy 2. We got a two for here, guys. They were both amazing titles and uh, I really can't wait to revisit them again, because honestly, it's been years. The next game we have here, donated by Kyle, is the uh, Super Smash Bros. Brawl for the Wii. Now, I didn't have this yet for my collection, so I was super excited. I've almost got all of the Super Smash Bros. now, and uh, that's a goal of mine that I have been gunning to complete. So, very thankful for that. Here we've got the uh, Wii Play. Everybody knows there's a... Uh, just some pool games on here. There's some table tennis. It's like a, a mini game based little uh, game for the Wii there. And yeah, I'm sure it's super fun. I actually haven't ever got the privilege to play this one yet, but I'm sure it's uh, cheesy and fun. Now, we got some other peripherals and additions for the Wii as well. Uh, he gave me this Wii gun. Um, Sure, it's used for a lot of Wii shooters, and uh, yeah, that's super neat as well. Came with the nunchuck in there. We got another Wii controller. I uh, needed that actually for the Wii U kiosk, so that worked out great. We have these two Thrustmaster controllers uh, that we also got to add to the collection. 
Kyle was gracious enough to give to us, and one of them is actually sealed, so that's super cool. I'm probably going to uh, keep the open one and take the sealed one to a convention and sell it. But yeah, it's going to be great. Here we have another Wii system that was graciously donated by Kyle as well. Now this, this is an odd peripheral that I uh, stumbled across when I was down in the disc replay in Columbus with uh, the lovely Laura. And basically what this is, it's a living room to living room um, chat speaker that you could incorporate for the Wii back in the day. Um, I think this is a super cool concept, and I couldn't pass it up for $3.99. It's very neat. Uh, it came out for Animal Crossing City Folk, and I think that's really neat. Like, you and your friend would have been visiting each other's towns, per se, and been able to connect via the Wii and been able to communicate with each other in your own living rooms. So, yeah, guys, it's really interesting. I was super happy to pick that up. The next game that I found down in Columbus that day was a game that I uh, hold near and dear to my heart from my childhood. It's uh, super nostalgic for me, and that is Arrow the Acrobat. Now, if you guys have ever played this, um, you take the role of Arrow, and basically he's a bat. He uh, is in the circus, and you run through the circus uh, battling clowns and doing various circus-type stunts, like being shot out of cannons. Um, balancing on tight ropes, riding unicycles. It's super fun. It's super challenging though. So don't expect just to pop this thing on and start running through the levels. Uh, it takes a lot of skill and prowess and you're going to cuss. I guarantee it. But yeah, it is a super, super cool game. I found it sealed in box for a really good price. I think I paid $30 for it. It's not bad for an inbox game. And uh, it's one that made me think of my childhood a lot. So really hit home for me had to pick it up alrighty now at the beginning of the month um, it was miss Laura's birthday on October 7th so what uh, I got her was the Nintendo switch Lite. we got her the turquoise boy here and uh, she is having so much fun with that she absolutely loves it and um, one of the games that I had got for her for her birthday as well is Nino Kuni Remastered for the Nintendo Switch. From what I've seen of it so far, it's a, it's an amazing story-driven RPG. Um, she's had to grind a lot of times on it, but if you're familiar with Studio Ghibli, it actually has the um, illustration styles from them, and all of the cutscenes are actually like hand-drawn Studio Ghibli. Um, artwork so it's it's truly fantastic guys it's really worth picking up super interesting and it's fun to watch her play it to be honest so stemming towards the uh, end of the month um, we all were longly anticipating um, Luigi's Mansion 3 to come out so you know on Halloween I had to be there first thing in the morning to pick it up we got uh, Luigi's Mansion 3 for the Nintendo Switch and Laura and I have absolutely fallen in love with it. Um, the one on the GameCube was one of my favorite games of all time. So I missed the one on the 3DS, I believe. I never played Luigi's Mansion 2. But I was excited to pick up this installment. And we have just been rocking it out, guys. It was so much fun. And I actually got my, t my uh, copy at Target here on East Washington Street. And uh, with good reason... I knew that they were going to be offering a Target exclusive candy tote bag with their purchase of Luigi's Mansion that day. So uh, you know I had to slide through and get that Target exclusive. The collector in me just couldn't help it guys. But yeah, I was super excited to snag that as well and I actually got um, two. You know I had to get one and keep it sealed in package. Now the last thing that I got, if you guys saw my uh, Wii U kiosk video, was a, uh, a Wii U kiosk that I picked up at Hope, Indiana. So we're going to slide to the living room and check that out. 
Well, here we are, guys. This is my Nintendo Wii U kiosk that I picked up in Hope, Indiana earlier last month. Now, uh, I couldn't be more excited to uh, be able to show you guys this. I was super stoked to add it to the collection, and I got a killer deal on it, only paying 100 bucks for this bad boy. Um, we got her home, and we threw Laura's Nintendo Wii U inside it here, and we've actually been hooking it up and playing it and getting some pretty good use out of it. So yeah, guys, there's my pickups for October. Um, we got some pretty solid stuff this month, and I couldn't be happier to have uh, been able to show you guys. So if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough again for watching, and this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Yeah! What is going on Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be doing a review of uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield. So if you like what you see here today be sure to click the links below to like, subscribe guys and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Without further ado, let's get right into it y'all. Alrighty guys, Laura and I uh, went and picked up our copies of Pokemon Sword and Shield last Friday, launch day, you know how we do it over here, and uh, we couldn't be more happier that we picked it up guys. Her and I went half actually on the Pokemon Sword and Shield combo pack, and I feel like this is such a great way to do it. Um, Laura took Pokemon Shield and I had the privilege of uh, getting Pokemon Sword, and we just couldn't be happier guys. Uh, it's really cool to do it that way because you guys can trade amongst each other for all of those Pokemon that are version specific. So we're gonna um, we're gonna really strive to complete our Pokédexes on this one and going half with each other and getting the combo pack made it a lot easier to do. So pretty stoked about that for sure. But as far as the overall gameplay and everything like that, I think it's amazing, honestly. I think the graphics are superb. I like the uh, Galarian region. Um, I think it's really unique and different. There's a, a lot to this game. Uh, one thing they introduced was the... Uh, prior to doing a gym battle, you actually have to do a challenge to earn the right to battle that gym leader. So I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, the first one, I um, got the first gym badge the other day. And it takes place in like a farm setting. Spoiler alert. Uh, it takes place in like a farm setting. And you actually have to uh, herd sheep before you can battle the gym leader. And I just thought that was super fun. It was really neat. But yeah, guys, it's super great. Uh, I think the three starter Pokemon that they went with were um, really awesome. You've got Sobble, you've got Score Bunny, and then you've got uh, Grookey the little monkey and that's the one that Laura chose and uh, he's adorable he's awesome I went with score bunny and I think he was a solid choice too I've always liked to start the games with the fire types so yeah that was really cool I've already leveled him up um, and evolved him into a raboot so pretty stoked but yeah guys um, the Dynamax the giant Pokemon that they added in this game is really cool. Honestly, I, uh, I'm i still not sure why it happens. I haven't gotten far enough into the game for them to explain that yet. But whatever makes it happen, it's freaking awesome. Because the epically huge battles that you have are cool as hell to watch. But yeah, it's pretty cool. So, um, 
We pre-ordered our version at GameStop, so we got this awesome uh, Pokemon, it's like a fabric uh, flag, and as you can see, it has the legendary Pokemon for Sword and uh, Shield on the front here, but it also has this cool-ass map of the uh, Galar region here on the back. I thought that was really awesome. Um, we're definitely going to find somewhere here in the Outlaw Bits game room to hang this sucker up, because it is super cool, guys gonna have to bust her open now as far as overall gameplay I think that uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield is truly amazing uh, there's a lot of it that actually kind of brings it back to the old-school Pokemon for me and that's something that I really enjoyed with the game I know a lot of people have had uh, some negative comments to say about it but I really think it's solid guys um, one thing that I did want to point out though is the functionality for this little guy right here. Now, most of you are familiar with the Pokeball Plus. It came out with Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu. Now, we have both uh, versions of that, but we've got this one open here, and that's the one that we like to uh, use and play. But in Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu, there was so much functionality for this Pokeball Plus. You could actually use it as a controller. Um, you could take your Pokemon in it and walk around, and they would not only gain experience, but they would find you items, and it was awesome. You could hear them cry while you're on the go, which is pretty neat. But yeah, there was a lot of functionality on those games. You could actually use this to catch your Pokemon, and uh, that was one of my favorite parts, honestly, about playing Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu. It made me feel like I was catching the Pokemon. You know, kind of immersive. But in Pokemon Sword and Shield, the compatibility and functionality for this is almost non existent. Um, you definitely can't use it as a controller, and that really upset me. Um, you can't catch your Pokemon with it, which was the biggest downfall for me. That was a letdown for sure. That was one of my favorite parts about it. But more than anything, um, I think it was. Kind of shame on Nintendo for designing a $50 peripheral that you could only use on one game. I know it's a marketing ploy. You want to make your money. I get it. Capitalism and all that. But this was unnecessary. I thought I was going to be able to use this for um, all the Pokemon games to come. And the second one... You know, the, the second one in the series for the Switch, the first one that came out after Pokemon Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu, they already took all the functionality away. And uh, it's kind of a shame. But other than that, guys, the, the, the Pokemon Sword and Shield are totally amazing. Um, I don't have any more complaints other than that. They're fantastic titles. I just wish they would have used that Pokeball functionality a little bit more. I could have got more... Um, more use out of the $50 price tag that I paid for it and that would have been awesome but it is what it is I guess guys so yeah we really enjoyed these games and uh, we couldn't be happier to uh, bring you this review today so if you like what you see here today be sure to click the links below to like subscribe and don't forget to ring uh, that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted I can't thank you guys enough for watching my review of Pokemon Sword and Shield. And uh, until next time, guys, this has been Kurt Stevens. What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I'm going to be going over my uh, top three favorite Pokemon from the Galarian region. I've been having so much fun with Pokemon Sword and Shield, guys, and I just couldn't wait to bring you this list of some of the Pokemon that I thought were really awesome in uh, the Galarian region. So yeah, if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it.
Alrighty guys, Pokemon uh, Sword and Shield's been out for a few weeks now, and Laura and I have been having such a great time with it. I'm sure you guys have caught into uh, one of our streams we've had the past couple weeks or so. I've been streaming the hell out of the game, and uh, been having a lot of fun with it guys. But today, I wanted to bring to you my top three favorite Pokemon that I've encountered so far in the Galar region, and uh, I can't wait guys, it's going to be awesome. So, the first Pokemon on our list here is actually uh, one of the starters, and it wasn't the starter that I uh, started the game with. I started the game with Score Bunny, and uh, the lovely Laura started the game with Grookey. And more than anything else, I just wanted to have a different gaming experience, so I started the game with a different starter than her. But to be honest, Grookey is completely adorable. I absolutely fell in love with the character, and uh, it's just super cool, guys. So his Pokédex states that when he uses his special stick, um, the sound waves that are produced and uh, carried revitalize the energy to the plants and flowers in the area. So that's just super cool. Uh, he's helpful to the environment. Go green. Grookey is the man for that. But yeah, he's just delightful, man. He's that cool little monkey. Uh, he carries a stick that he beats his enemies with. And I just think he's super cute and awesome. Um, the second Pokemon that uh, I just absolutely fell in love with from the Galarian region is the Galarian Ponyta. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen her yet, but she is just the most beautiful Ponyta that you have ever seen. Um, her skin is this light, like, white color. And her hair is this cotton candy assortment of uh, like a turquoise and purple. And she is so awesome, guys. And her Pokedex states that the, the small horn on her head hides a healing power. And that uh, with a few rubs of it, you can heal slight wounds that you have. So she's awesome. And on this game, she's actually a fairy type. So that was really cool, too. But, yeah, I can't wait to evolve her. Um, I haven't done that yet to see what the Galarian Rapidash looks like. It's going to be pretty sick. I know it. And then, uh, yeah, guys, the last Pokemon, the third Pokemon on my list of uh, favorite Galarian Pokemon here is Perserker. So, in the Galar region, uh, Meowth, if you guys have seen him yet, he is super cool. He looks totally different than the other regions. He has this big fluffy beard and he's kind of this awesome tan color. Well, instead of evolving into a Persian, the Meowth in the Galarian region, um, he evolves into Perserker. And Perserker is really freaking awesome. He looks so mean. He's got these big hardy black claws, this huge bushy beard. And um, he actually has like what resembles to be a black Viking helmet on his head. But his Pokédex states that even though it appears to be an iron helmet, it's actually hardened hair. So uh, yeah, it's pretty intense, guys. And it says that this Pokémon lives for the thrill of battle. And if you guys play the game, you'll know uh, this is no lie. This Pokémon is super aggressive when you meet them in the wild. They just instantly run up to your character and instigate a battle with you. So yeah, I thought that was really cool as well. But yeah, guys, um, this concludes this concludes my list for my top three favorite Pokemon from the Galarian region. They're all super cool, and I love them for all different reasons. Um, I can't wait to evolve my Grookey and my Ponyta, see how that goes. But uh, for the as for the Perserker, I think he's already maxed out and fully evolved. But he's awesome nonetheless, guys. So, yeah. I think that'll do it for my uh, list of my favorite Pokemon here. If you like what you saw here today, click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I think I'm going to uh, buckle down, get some pizza, and uh, play some Switch on my Snorlax beanbag chair here, guys. So thanks for coming hanging out with us. This has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off.
What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kerr Stevens here, back with Outlaw Bits Gaming. And I know, guys, it has been far too long, but uh, I've made a full recovery from the surgery. I'm just taking it easy, and I thought it was time to bring you guys another pickups video. So we're going to be doing the pickups for the month of November, and I got some super solid stuff to share with you guys. I can't wait to show you. So if you like what you see here today, guys, be sure to click those links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so let's go ahead and get started here. I'm uh, going to start with the game that I got earliest in the month of November, and that was November 8th, Death Stranding. Um, it is amazing guys, it's a little obscure, uh, there was a lot of mixed reviews about it, but it ended up winning some awards at the uh, video game award show here last week, so yeah, I thought that was well deserved, and um, it's a Hideo Kojima game which is phenomenal. As you can tell by my shirt, I am a big Hideo fan. Kind of like the titles he puts out. They're pretty good. Uh, but yeah, guys, I'm probably about 8 to 10 hours into the game or so, so I haven't played it enough to give you guys a fair review on it, but that'll be coming up very soon, and uh, I'm going to get cracking and, and put some more hours into it here this week, so yeah, it's going to be great. But, uh... The next thing that I got this month, it was something that I was super excited about, and I've actually been on the hunt for uh, for a long time. But the awesome dudes at the exchange on East Washington Street had one ordered in for me from a store in Chicago, and that is a Sony PlayStation 2 Multitap. Now, I've been looking for one of these for a grip. Uh, me and my friends like to play Champions of Norath and Champions Return to Arms, and that's a four-player co-op like RPG dungeon crawler. If you guys have never played it, you need to go pick it up. Super fun. But yeah, I needed to get a multi-tap so me and the boys could jam out on it. Um, while I was at this, uh, the exchange that day, I actually had some points that I had accumulated throughout the year. And I needed to use them. So the next thing that I got was this awesome Collector's Edition Fable 3. Now, I uh, didn't know this even existed until I saw it that day, but it has this awesome, like, leather hardback cover feel to it. Um, it actually has, where is it? It's so secret that I can't even find it. There's a secret compartment. So you open it up, you got your game, pretty standard, but then you flap this little guy down. Oh, what do we have here? We got some pretty awesome stuff, guys. The first thing that comes with it is a sealed, still sealed, check that out, fact, uh, a pack of Fable 3 playing cards. So that's really freaking cool. Um, I'm not going to open them. I'm going to leave them there. But the thing I was most excited about that I found in here was this super sick guild coin. I'm a huge fan of Fable, and to just have one of these guild coins that... It made my day. I was so happy to have found this. And uh, I don't think I paid too unreasonable for this game. I think I only paid about 15 to $20 for this collector's edition Fable 3. But yeah, guys, it was super cool. I'm glad I found it. Um, the next game that I picked up that month was actually a twofer. And that is Pokemon Sword and Shield. The Miss Lovely Laura and I, uh, we actually went half on the bundle pack together. Try to save a little bit of money there. But, um, yeah guys, it was really awesome. We had such great fun with it. Laura is still grinding on that game so hard right now. But, uh, I beat my 
my gyms pretty fast. I'm going to say in a week or so. We did it on the live stream and uh, I'm ready to move on back to Death Stranding. But I definitely want to complete my Pokédex and I had a lot of fun playing this game, guys. Super excited to add it to the collection. And when I uh, pre-ordered it from Disc Replay, I got this awesome shield-shaped uh, flag, Pokemon Sword and Shield, and it actually has the Galarian region map on the back. Thought that was really cool. But yeah, guys. Super sick. Now the last thing that I got in the month of November, um, I kind of got on a Fable kick after I found Fable 3, and I got a really good deal on the original Fable. It actually still has the uh, manual inside. I was super happy about it, but guys, I think I picked this up for five bucks. And it's one of the best games that I ever played, and it brings me back to my childhood and just fills me with nostalgia. So I couldn't pass it up for that. But yeah, those are my solid pickups for the month of November, guys. Um, I know it had been a minute since I posted a video, but I'm glad to be back in action and uh, ready to get back on the streams, too. Now, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of our videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough again for watching my November pickups, and I hope that you enjoyed it. And uh, this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Pew. Yeah! What is going on Outlaws? It's Kerr Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be doing a full Game Boy modification of my Atomic Purple Game Boy Color here. Uh, we're doing it for the Miss Lovely Laura for Christmas and it's going to be a surprise gift. I know she's absolutely going to love it. But we are going to do a uh, full LCD backlit screen. We are going to replace the Standard AA batteries here with a rechargeable 2000 milliamp battery, as well as um, adding a awesome micro USB port on the side so that we can recharge the battery. It's going to be pretty sick, guys. But if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys. Let's rip this sucker open and get her going. Alrighty guys, we uh, chose this Atomic Purple Game Boy to do this mod project with. I picked this thing up in one of my various trades this year, and I was super excited to use it guys. I was actually really upset that I couldn't save this 1-800 Nintendo number here on the bottom, but uh, that's okay. We'll move past that. The most important tools we need for this project are in this tool case right here, and I will have a link in the description for that. We're going to start off by taking the uh, tri bit here and taking these four screws on the outer shell. We're going to remove those there, as you can see here. And uh, there's also going to be two more inside the dust cover, inside the battery cover here. So we're going to take that off. We're going to go ahead and uh, use the same tri tip screwdriver. We're going to take those two boys out, make six screws in total. After you got those puppies out of there, it is time to take this shell apart, guys. Be super careful when doing so. Make sure not to damage anything. A little bit of prying and pulling and you'll get her apart. And there it is, guys. That is the motherboard of a Game Boy Color. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? Next, you're going to take a uh, Phillips head screwdriver and you're going to take these three screws apart here. 
These are what hold the motherboard to the back of the shell where the screen's located. Be very careful when you pull that apart. There is going to be a, a ribbon here on the top that holds the screen in. And what you're going to do there is you're going to pull these little pins with either a small screwdriver or your fingernail like so. You're going to be able to remove that ribbon, guys. It's pretty easy. Just be uh, careful with it. She's brittle. And there you have it. That is the uh, motherboard separated from the shell there. And as you can see, the screen and the uh, cover are still attached. Next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to remove some of the plastic here <clears throat> inside the battery cover so that we can fit the new rechargeable battery that we're going to add for the mod. And here we are, guys. This is a, a 2,000 milliamp hour battery. It should last a while. It is completely rechargeable. And uh, in order to take that plastic out, we're going to use our handy dandy X-Acto knife kit here. Very cool. So you're going to score along this edge on all four corners of the uh, plastic on the inside here. And that should weaken the integrity enough uh, for you to get that sucker out of there, guys. Here we have the um, board that we're going to use to make this a rechargeable battery pack Game Boy and here we have the connections that we're going to use for solder points we have the micro USB port there on the uh, side and we are just going to hot glue that to a good position that you see fit on the board now the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to get this screen out and a good tip here is just to kind of twist the Game Boy left and right you can uh, push and pry on the screen to try to pop it out, and then once you get one of those corners lifted, it's uh, pretty easy from there, guys. We finally got her here, and um, as you can see, it comes out of there pretty easily. Next thing you want to do is remove this plastic cover. Now, it is held in by some pretty strong adhesive. It's honestly some really impressive stuff, and it is super hard to get off. But yeah super cool and now we've got that removed the next thing we're gonna do is remove a piece of the plastic here on the uh, inside that will allow the new LCD screen mod to fit inside a little bit better so we are going to take the uh, handy dandy pliers here and we're going to cut strategically on both sides of that plastic like so then we're gonna take our exacto knife and we're gonna score along that edge to uh, weaken the plastic there and you should be able just to take your pliers and bend it off after that there you go guys you'll get it nice and smooth and remove that plastic there and you'll be good to go next thing is to remove some of that uh, residue that glue from the plastic screen cover you're gonna get some isopropyl alcohol <clears throat> and then you're just gonna scrub away here on the front after that it is time to take this McWill LCD screen mod that I got and uh, you're gonna test fit it inside the plastic guys so go ahead and grab your casing there and stick it on in there make sure it all fits good you might have to remove some more plastic but that's okay and it's looking like it's fitting tight guys pretty nice very good next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the motherboard there and we're going to remove the uh, positive and negative terminals off of the board with these two solder points we're gonna get our soldering iron hot and we're gonna desolder those from the board as you can see here Next thing we're going to do is uh, solder those wires to the board where they go. So we're going to take the positive to the uh, positive on the board there. We're going to take the negative to the negative on the board. Very simple stuff, guys. 
Next thing we're going to do is we're going to connect the battery to the two inner points on the control board. Now it's a really easy process. You already have the two wires on the outside points there, so you're just going to take the positive and the negative on those inside points. And there it is, guys, when it's all done up. We got it looking pretty clean there and uniform. We've hot glued some of the wires to the board there to make them look a little more clean and uh, stay in place better. And next we are gonna plug her up. We're gonna see if it works, guys. The moment of truth here. We got our micro USB. We have plugged her in and there we have it. That red light means that she is charging and ready to go, folks. Super stoked. After that, it was time to uh, get the shell all painted and primed and ready, and we went with this awesome lavender color. As you can see here, after three coats of uh, paint and three coats of clear coat, we were ready to slap her back together, guys. I really like how that color turned out. This is an Espeon-themed Game Boy, so that, that color was spot on. It had to be perfect. Next, we're going to take these awesome red buttons that I got from retromodding.com and we're gonna slap those in her guys we've got the SNES lavender there for the start button and it came with that awesome sticker here's those red buttons they just look so crisp and we're about to slap them on in there so you're just gonna put them in like so and then afterwards you're going to put the rubber covers back on them and uh, yeah guys pretty awesome stuff Here we are, putting the finishing touches on the buttons, and uh, now it's time to put that screen on, guys. So since this is the final run, we're going to remove the plastic on the front of the screen there. We're going to stick her on down in place. Make sure that everything's sitting fine and straight. And we got her pressed in there pretty good. Oh yeah, she's fitting great, guys. Now uh, you want to make sure that that ribbon is out of the way when you put the motherboard back on. So we're going to go ahead and grab the battery and the motherboard here. We're going to sit that in place. And after that, guys, it is time to reattach that ribbon on the top. This is the easiest plug and play uh, screen mod that I can find by McWill and it is absolutely fantastic. So we're gonna reattach those clips there on the screen and we're good to go guys. We're gonna put the uh, metal plating back on the inside of the back cover of the Game Boy and we're gonna slap her back together. After that, it's time to feed the uh, battery back into the battery hole there. Make sure not to pinch any wires and to test that the uh, back cover still fits. And the battery cover fits, guys. Awesome stuff. Next, we're going to take this awesome glass um, Game Boy Color Light screen protector that I got. We're going to take the 3 millimeter tape off the back and we're going to set it in place there. Make sure that you have it where you want it, guys, because this stuff is super sticky. And I'm going to have the link in the description below from uh, Jelly Belly Customs where I got this screen. After that, we're going to put the finishing touches on her. We're going to put this awesome Game Boy Color Light sticker, also custom from Jelly Belly. And yeah, that'll do it. Alrighty, guys. This is the uh, finished product here of the Game Boy Color Light, the Espeon theme that I made for the Miss Lovely Laura here. And we have the full lit McWill LCD screen. We've got the charging port there on the side. And it just looks stunning, guys. The color on this looks amazing. Love how it turned out. Couldn't be happier. Now, if you like what you saw here today, guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. If you want to see me uh, mod some more awesome retro video games like this, be sure to like, subscribe, guys, and thanks for watching. This is Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off.
What is going on Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be doing a, a speaker replacement on my Game Boy Color. Now my speaker's been uh, bad in this Game Boy for a long time and I haven't uh, seen any good tutorials here on YouTube of how to do it so I thought that I would bring you guys one. So if you like what you see here today guys be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, the first thing you're going to need is this Nintendo screwdriver kit. Um, you can get it off Amazon, I'll have the links in the description below. And you're going to get your uh, tri-tip screwdriver here, this little small guy. This works on a lot of Nintendo stuff. And you are going to take out these six screws on the back of the Game Boy Color. Now this is my original Game Boy from when I was a kid. You can see my initials on the back there, and it's missing the battery port, but that's okay. So go ahead and get started taking these screws out. You should be in no time. Alrighty guys, we've got the screws out. Now we're gonna take the shell apart there. As you can see, this is the inside of the motherboard. Looking good. And there is the speaker we're gonna change, guys. Super cool stuff. You can see he's pretty worn out and old looking there. Next thing we're going to need is this 2.0 Phillips bit screwdriver out of your kit. And that is for these three screws here on the motherboard that um, hold the board to the front plate of the Game Boy. Go ahead and get started taking those guys out and you will uh, have it out there in no time. Now that we've got those screws out, we're going to carefully lift that. We're going to check the speaker out here for a second. Yep, she's coming out. Next thing you're going to do is remove the screen uh, so you don't damage it. And you're going to release these pins here with a small screwdriver or your fingernail, as you can see there. And then you're going to uh, gently lift this ribbon. And after that, she is free to come out of there, guys. Go ahead and uh, safely lift the board out of there. And check her out. Pretty neat stuff, huh? Alrighty guys, next thing we're going to do is desolder the old speaker from the board. And this is really simple. You're just going to get your iron hot. You're going to apply some pressure with the tweezers. Hit those solder points and it uh, should snap right off as you can see here. Comes off super easy guys. This is honestly one of the, um, what I would call a beginner level mod for the Game Boy. And it's not that difficult to do so don't be scared of it y'all. And here we have the new premium amplified speaker that we're going to drop in there. Now I got this sucker off of Amazon, but there's some great websites that have some speakers for sale as well, like Retro Modding and Body Pixel. But uh, I needed it fast, so I got it Amazon Primed. Here's a little comparison of the uh, new speaker to the old speaker there. Looking fresh. Now we're going to solder the new speaker to the board. We're just going to go ahead and reuse the old wi uh, wires here. And yeah, we're going to connect it here on these two points. Should be good to go. Now it doesn't matter which way you connect them. And here we are. We're going to give it a tug to make sure it's secure there. And we are good, guys. After that, it's time to uh, button up the Game Boy so we can test her out and see if she works. You're going to gently put that back in there and reattach the ribbon. Set your screws and you'll be good to go. Now we've got the outer shell on. We're going to put these six screws on the outside with our tri bit. Well, there we have it guys. My Game Boy is all buttoned up and put back together and it is ready to play. Now, uh, if you guys like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. 
And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Alrighty guys, so let's go ahead and uh, turn this sucker on and see what we got. Alrighty guys, now we're going to slap some double A's back in this bad boy. And we're going to take this uh, imported Kirby game here. It's got great sound. We're going to test her out and see how it sounds, y'all. Oh yeah, that sounds so crystal clear. I am loving it, guys. As you can see, I'm really excited that I got it going here. This thing has been broken for a long time and I couldn't be happier. Thank you guys for tuning in and I'll catch you on the next one. What is going on Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today we're going to be doing a pickups video for the month of December. Now, I wanted to give a special shout out to lovely Laura before we even start, because she absolutely hooked me up this Christmas, and she gave me a plethora of amazing things to show you guys for this monthly pickups video. I got a couple other things too in there uh, to show you guys, a couple rare items, but uh, for the most part, this pickups video is all her guys. So if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, boys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, now uh, the first batch of pickups that I have for you here actually came from a lot um, that the Miss Lovely Laura got on eBay for me, and I want to give you guys a little bit more of a backstory to it. So basically, I have been trying to get my hands on a very specific Nintendo 3DS XL for the better part of a year or so, and um, specifically it's the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask Gold Edition. It's Freaking stellar, guys. Looks beautiful. But uh, I've always wanted one, and I've been looking for one complete in box in the wild for a long time. Now, I found one out of box at the exchange up on East Washington Street for about 200 bucks. but I just knew that, uh, I knew that I could probably find one for around 250 to 275 out in the wild somewhere with the box, so I just wasn't ready to fork over the 200 to get one out of box. But uh, anyway... So I had been searching for it for a very long time, and not only did she find me that Legend of Zelda uh, Majora's Mask 3DS XL complete in box, but she also found me two more 3DSs, guys. My mind was blown here. So I've got this one. It is in pristine condition. It's almost like the guy never played it, but she also got me the Link Between Worlds Limited Edition Hyrule 3DS XL as well, guys. And this is complete inbox. Same thing. It all came in the same lot uh, from a collector. And it is just pristine. It looks like it's never been used. He did open them up, but honestly, I think it was just a look at them. Because there's not a, a scratch on those suckers, bub. Now, the third one that came in the lot... It is a, a regular 3DS, but it's the Hyrule Edition too, and I thought it was really cool. It came with this awesome battery pack. Pretty much doubles the battery life of it, so that was really neat. And uh, as you guys know, these 3DSs don't come with chargers, so I had to go hunt one of those down. But it is fantastic, guys. These things are so beautiful. I just love the uh, Zelda engraving on the front here, and we've got the gold back. It just looks superb. I was super excited to get those. But that is not all, guys. There was a lot more stuff that came in this lot, honestly. And uh, 
Like I said, I gotta hand it to her. She pretty much took over this entire pickups video with her Christmas presents to me. And I'm just so grateful. She did such a good job. The next thing I have here to show you is this uh, Zelda limited edition Twilight Princess HD Wii lunchbox. So this came with pre-order of the game, I believe. But it also <clears throat> has some pretty amazing collectibles inside as well. It has the uh, Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess HD soundtrack. And it is completely sealed still. I'm going to keep it that way. <laughs> no use in opening it up. I'll just uh, jam them on YouTube if I want to listen to the songs. And it came with this awesome Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess um, disc sleeve. So this would have kept all your Wii games in there. And it is really cool, guys. Oh, there's a card in here that says Majora. I didn't find that till just now, but that's pretty neat. All right, all right. So besides the lunchbox, I also got this awesome limited edition Zelda Majora's Mask 3D watch. And as you can see, it is an awesome watch that has Majora's Mask there on the face. It's killing me, guys. Truth be told, not to open this thing up bust those bands on the inside and wear this as my daily watch because it is sick and that purple on there was stunning but yeah so uh that's pretty much the most exciting part of the uh pickups here the last thing that i got was this madden 20 um i got it in a trade with one of my buddies and uh I think I'm going to try to trade it for something else. Sports games really aren't my bag, but uh, nothing against them. It's just I played Madden since the beginning and kind of sick of it by 2020. I've been playing this since like 1995. But yeah, guys, I picked that up. And then, oh, actually, wait. The last thing that I got in the month of uh, December was actually on the very last day. The lovely Laura and I uh, headed up into Indianapolis, and we met a fella in Irvington that had the original Nintendo GameCube Wave Bird controller. Now, for uh, those of you that don't know, Wave Bird is actually a third-party controller company. They, they make a lot of wireless gear for uh, multiple systems, but Nintendo actually did a partnership with them for the Nintendo GameCube to make this awesome, fully licensed GameCube controller. And I even got the, uh, I think this is called the Doppler, but it's got a little channel knob. It's got a little channel knob here on the bottom. You've got to dial in so that you can get the uh, correct signal for your wave bird here. But yeah, thought that was pretty cool, and I was super excited to have it. I've been looking for one of those for a minute, and I actually missed an opportunity to get one at the uh, disc replay on East Washington Street a couple weeks back. That sucker went fast, man. But uh, they had it priced on sale for $39.95, which honestly, from a collector standpoint, that's about it's about half price. I've seen them go for about 70 or 80 bucks, especially at uh, conventions and stuff. So I was really excited to uh, snag her up, guys, and yeah, couldn't be happier with it. But these are the amazing pickups that I got for the month of December. Now, like I said, I wanted to give a special thanks to the Miss Lovely Laura. She absolutely made my Christmas wonderful, and uh, she hooked me up for sure. Um, if you like what you saw here today, guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell for uh, all upcoming Outlaw Bits videos. And uh, you got to keep yourself notified, guys. It's pretty important stuff here. So... Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been Kerr Stevens, signing off. What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kerr Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today, we're going to be doing a review of Death Stranding for the PlayStation 4. Now, uh, 
I know this has been longly anticipated, the game came out in November, but I finally finished it, guys, after about 53 hours or so, um, in between playing some other things, I finally finished Death Stranding, and today, I'm going to be uh, letting you know what I think about it, and let me tell you guys, it is something else. So if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. guys so what to say about Death Stranding here well first off as you can see here it's a uh, Hideo Kojima game which is one of the main reasons that I picked it up he is absolutely my favorite video game developer of all time and I was such a huge fan of the Metal Gear Solid series um, I hold the series near and dear to my heart and I'll always say that it's my favorite game series of all time um, his games are very story driven and they usually have a bit of complexity to them, but Death Stranding is a whole different animal. This story is definitely out there, guys. And if you play this game, buckle up your seat belts. During the cutscenes, you can't miss a beat. You have to pay attention to every single word of it, or you're going to miss a vital clue, and you're going to feel lost at times. Um, there's also, in the options menu, like in your game HUD, there is an email function and there's a lot of vital information hidden within some of those emails too. Now, none of them are necessary to, you know, completing the game per se, but it's very interesting stuff and uh, it's definitely very lore focused in the emails. Gives you some insight on the world around you a little bit more. But yeah, as far as the gameplay goes, guys, I thought it was groundbreaking and revolutionary, honestly. It was reminiscent of the Fox Engine, which was the last game that uh, Hideo Kojima designed was the Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain. They designed that Fox Engine for that game. And um, it looks superb on both accounts. But oh, yeah, this, crazy. it has a lot of subtle changes because it's a totally different game and a new animal. It has this feature where in order to stabilize yourself while you are, um, while you're, hauling like heavy cargo on your back you can hit the L and R triggers to actually grab your shoulder straps and kind of stabilize yourself so I thought that was very cool um, it helps you out when you're like traversing down a, a hill or a mountainous range or something like that it's super interesting but the story uh, follows the character iteration of Norman Reedus and his name in the game is Sam Porter Bridges and basically um, spoiler alert at the beginning of the game you get introduced to what is known as the time fall and basically when it rains in this new world um, the rain is acidic and it actually ages you rapidly so if you get caught out in the time fall and let's say your entire body's out there, you will literally age from, from what you are now to bones and dust. It, it's some nasty stuff, guys. But after that, you are introduced to the uh, President of the United States, which happens to be um, Sam Porter Bridge's mother. And basically she recruits you to establish what is known as the chiral network across America. So basically, um, the story goes that these BTs now inhabit the world and they came when the time fall came. And what they are is they're essentially beings that are tied to the other side. They're like ghosts but they're in our realm and you can actually see them 
And um, what you have to do is you have to traverse through BT territory to reach other civilizations and outposts and other doomsday preppers to establish this chiral network. So the story is pretty out there, guys. It gets super deep. I'm not going to go into all of it. But basically when you establish this chiral network, it allows you to build structures that will help you along your journey in that area. So let's say I started at City A and moved to City B and established the chiral network. Anywhere in between those two points, I can build things like generators to establish electricity. I can build bridges to link bodies of uh, land masses over water and things like that. So essentially, the main point of the game is to get from one side of America and to establish this chiral network and to rebuild all these connections in between people. And I just thought that concept was super interesting. It's in this day and age, it's a really interesting concept to think about because even though we're more connected with uh, social media than ever before, we're kind of more disconnected than ever on a lot of other aspects. And this game kind of hits home on that. It's really, it's really thought provoking. But like I said, guys, the story is deep. The gameplay mechanics are fantastic. Um, there's a lot of neat things you can do with the motorcycle. You can actually, there's like a jump function I thought was cool. But other than that, guys, the graphics are stunning. Um, the motion capture that they used for this game was just truly impeccable. You've got Norman Reedus, you've got Del Toro, and uh, they just, they look spot on. Every rendition of uh, every single person that is in this game just looks immaculate. It's like they're really there. I'm playing it in 1080 currently, but uh, it's just it's fantastic and you couldn't ask for better graphics, guys. But this game definitely pushes the bounds uh, graphically. Um, yeah, super great. I completed it after about 53 and a half hours or so. I think, I think that was it. And I'm going to tell you guys, Hideo Kojima is known for his cutscenes. But this game takes the cake. I think one of the cutscenes at the end of the game was like an hour, maybe an hour and a half long. I'm not sure. Gotta time it. But yeah, so for a person like me who absolutely loves and adores story-driven games, like that's why I play games, is these thought-provoking stories that just make you delve in and feel immersed. And Death Stranding definitely did that for me. So it's definitely got Outlaw Bit seal of approval, guys. There you have it. That is my review of Hideo Kojima's Death Stranding. And I really hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching my review of Death Stranding. And uh, we'll catch you next time, guys. This is Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Yeah! Fuck yeah! What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today... We're going to be taking a look at this awesome Nintendo 64 sticker set that the Miss Lovely Laura found for me at Retro Collector Supply. And uh, we're also going to be going over what you need to do to the cartridges to get them prepped and ready to get these stickers to adhere to them. So, if you like what you see here, guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well... Without any further ado, let's get right into it.
Alrighty guys, so first thing you're going to do is get rid of that pesky package and um, it's going to expose these awesome sticker sheets. Now these sheets are a complete US collection of uh, Nintendo 64 games and primarily what they're used for is if you've ever kept your N64 games in like a storage container or some sort of case where they sit face up you'll know that uh, when you pull those suckers out of there that it is almost impossible to tell what game you're grabbing because all you can see is the front of the cartridge here, the very tip top of it. But these labels actually eliminate that. Um, they give a nice, detailed, beautiful sticker uh, to put on the top of it so that you can easily identify your games. So I thought that was really awesome. And um, it's also cool because as you collect games, if you're trying to, like, let's say, complete the entire United States uh, N64 collection, every time you get a new game, you know you don't have to collect it anymore because you can put the sticker on it. You know that's one less off your list. So that's really awesome. But uh, basically, guys, what you're going to do is you're going to get your handy-dandy friend isopropyl alcohol here. And if you clean video games frequently, you know that this is going to be your best friend and companion. Um, you are going to get a paper towel, slightly damp, and you're going to take the top of your uh, cartridge of choice. Today we are going to be using Worms Armageddon, and you're going to clean that sucker off. You don't want it to be too saturated, so you're going to keep... Uh, some of your paper towel clean there. You're basically just looking to get all residue and anything that um, will keep the sticker from adhering off of there. Then you are going to go through these sheets and you are going to find the game that you seek. And here we got Worms Armageddon. You're going to gently peel that off. And then you are going to slap it on top of the cartridge, guys. And it is that simple. Well, there you have it, guys. This has been my brief overview of the uh, Retro Collector Supply Complete Collection of N64 stickers. Now, like I said, guys, these are a super convenient way to keep your games more organized. And it lets you know exactly what game you're picking up so you can get straight to the action. And uh, I stand behind that wholeheartedly. So if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click those links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough again for watching. And this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. What's going on guys? It is Brent from Brent's Basement and today we have Outlaw Bits Gaming here with me and we are going to be talking about our two favorite Nintendo Switch titles. So, let's get into it. Thank you so much for the introduction, Brent, and this week we're going to be giving you our top two favorite titles for the Nintendo Switch. I'm super excited to be doing this collaboration, guys, and I couldn't be happier to be giving you my list of my top two favorite Nintendo Switch games. Now I will tell you though, with so many amazing titles in the Nintendo Switch library, it was super difficult to make a decision on which two were my favorite. But after some heavy deliberation and a lot of thought, I think we finally figured it out, guys. And my number two spot for my favorite Nintendo Switch title is Pokemon Sword and Shield. Now, this game was super great, guys. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, it brought back a lot of nostalgic memories for me. I loved Pokemon being on a console system again. And 
I love the introduction of all the new Pokemon in the Galarian region. I thought that they were super neat, fascinating. I had a lot of fun catching them. Um, I haven't completed my Pokedex yet, but we are well on our way, guys. And yeah, it's just a super great title and it's really solid, and I had a lot of fun with it. So that is why it stole the spot for my number two favorite Nintendo Switch title. Now my spot for the number one Nintendo Switch title might ruffle some tail feathers here because there's uh, a lot of heavy hitters on the system and a lot of iconic title to compete with. But the game that I personally had the most fun with this year when I was playing it was The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. I just had a great time, guys. The mechanics on this game were just super amazing and it was just such a nostalgic feeling that it brought me back to, man. I remember playing uh, Link's Awakening DX on the Game Boy and having a lot of fun with that when I was a kid, before it even came out on the Game Boy Color with the updated version. So, to be able to play this game with the updated Nintendo Switch graphics, it just really hit home for me, man. It made me really happy. I love the chibi art style that they went with. It was super eye-catching, and uh, it was overall just a great game, guys. It actually delved a little deeper into the story, and a lot of the NPCs had more to say than they originally did on the Game Boy version, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. And that is why The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening has stolen the Outlaw Bits Gaming's number one spot for the Nintendo Switch titles. And uh, I just, I love it guys. Can't say it enough. Now, you know your boy had to go and pick up the uh, Link's Awakening Dreamers Edition. And I kept it sealed. This came with an awesome art book, and if you guys haven't seen it yet, you gotta go check her out. But yeah, guys, that has been my top two favorite Nintendo Switch titles, and I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take it away, Brent. I have to admit, both of those games are really great, but I do not have those in my top two, so I'm gonna tell you my top two. Now, moving on to the number two spot, I have to go with one of my favorites that recently came out, and that is Luigi's Mansion 3. Now this recently came out and this is a really great game. I enjoyed this game from top to bottom. I have already beat this game and I definitely plan on doing a second playthrough because I enjoy it so much. And I usually don't get games that come out on day one unless it's a game that I really, really want. And being such a huge fan of the Luigi's Mansion series, this was a must have for me. The best part about this game to me is, you know, there are different environments and areas throughout this game in the mansion. There's a shopping center, a kitchen you go through, a greenhouse, and also a dinosaur museum. So if you guys haven't had a chance to check out Luigi's Mansion 3 on the Nintendo Switch, I highly recommend it. Now moving on to my number one spot, I speak about this game all the time on my channel and I'm just blown away with this game and that is Super Mario Odyssey. Now this game to me is amazing and just when you think that they've done all that they can do with Mario, they give him a hat named Cappy and he can control objects or also other people. Now the Super Mario franchise has been around since 85 so you've had 30 plus years of consistent quality games for Mario. Now what I really love about this game, even though it's a modern Mario game, it still pays homage to its retro roots. Now it also pays homage to the original Donkey Kong, for those who don't know, originally that's where Mario got his start from, but he went by a different name called Jumpman. Now this game is so much fun, if you haven't played Super Mario Odyssey on the Nintendo Switch, I highly recommend it. Okay, now that wraps up our top two favorite Nintendo Switch games, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'd like to thank Outlaw Bits Gaming for being on the channel, and also make sure you guys don't forget to super smash that like button, drop a comment down below. Tell us what your favorite Nintendo Switch games are. Until next time, what happens in the basement stays in the basement. See ya. What is going on, guys? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today, we're going to be unboxing the package that Mr. Drumstick sent me in our epic trade that we did over uh, Instagram Live. So if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, y'all, let's get right into it.
guys. So we are going to uh, be ripping open this awesome package that Mr. Drumstick sent me here. Got our addresses taped out there for safety precautions. But this is the first package that I ever got that said to Outlaw Bits Gaming. And uh, that's fucking awesome. So it's really great. Let's go ahead and uh, open her on up here. We'll show you guys what we got. I was really satisfied with this trade, guys. I think, uh, honestly, both parties came out really well. I think it was a very fair and even trade. Let's see what we got here. guys so the first game that I got in the trade was a uh, Final Fantasy 12 here and this was such an epic title for the PS2 I've uh, been wanting to play it for a long time and I have um, 10 and 11 so it was only right that I got 12 as well but yeah ooh, it's got some original booklets and stuff in there very cool I like that very nice stuff man but yeah, I was really excited to be doing this trade, Mr. Drum Six. He's a super cool dude, and uh, he's a longtime fan of the channel. And I think it's really cool to kind of touch base and get to do that stuff with fans. So yeah. And this is the uh, next game that I got in the trade. It's called Star Ocean. Now I'm not super familiar with the series, but I guess there's a lot of these games, and I heard from uh, fans of the series that it was really amazing. So. Can't wait to try it out. Ooh, we got multiple discs in here, guys. Looks like we have two discs. So it's going to be one of those. Definitely going to get your uh, $5.99 worth out of that one. Mm. Ooh. Alrighty. So it looks like I have the uh, Kingdom Hearts. It is HD2 and the final chapter prologue. Um, I've been trying to get all the Kingdom Hearts games, so I was really happy to add this to the collection as well. Super neat stuff here. Came with the booklet and the disc. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> now the next game that uh, I got in the trade was something I was really excited to get as well. If you guys have ever seen the Adventure Time series, um, they made an awesome game for the PS4. But uh, anyway, the land of Ooh is underwater, and it's up to Finn and Jake to find out why. And it's just super fun, guys. The gameplay looks amazing on this if you haven't checked it out yet. I highly suggest it. And uh, yeah. Ooh. It even came with some freaking stickers, man unused. Thank you so much, Mr. Drumsticks. That was a nice touch there, buddy. All right. Now, the final game, the one I was most excited about trading for, was uh, South Park, The Fractured But Whole. Now, if you guys have played The Stick of Truth, um, you know it is just so outrageous. South Park is one of my favorite cartoon series ever, and this game just Seals the deal. Takes the cake. It is crazy. It's uh, RPG style, so it's super fun. If you guys haven't seen any gameplay, definitely check that out as well. Um, the storyline is really unique. This one takes the role of uh, superheroes, whereas the Stick of Truth is more like Final Fantasy, uh, like Lord of the Rings type. But yeah, this game's super fun. Check it out if you haven't. But there we have it, guys. Um, he actually threw in this awesome map as well. Oh, yeah. The Northern Realms. So I thought that was super cool. I really appreciate it, Mr. Drumsticks. Man, that is awesome. This is a uh, map of the Witcher territory. So that is sick.
But there we have it, y'all. That is the games I got during my trade. If you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Can't thank you guys enough for watching, and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Yeah! What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today, love is in the air, folks. You know as well as I do. It is February 14th, and it is Valentine's Day. So, uh, in honor of the holidays, I thought with all this love going around in the air, I would bring to you my top three games that I love the most for the Super Nintendo. So, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so rolling in at the number three spot for my uh, favorite Super Nintendo games that I just absolutely love the most is Zombies Ate My Neighbors. Now if you guys aren't familiar with this, uh, Zombies Ate My Neighbors is an amazing over the top shooter game and the co-op system on this is absolutely just, just great guys. That's actually what I love the most about this. I have so many memories as a kid running around and uh, just blowing up zombies with my friends and that's why I love this game so much. But it's super challenging. I will warn you there. Um, once you lose all your lives, you have to start the game over. But there is a password system, so that's super cool. But yeah, guys, this game is just truly great. And if you haven't played it yet, I highly suggest going and picking it up. It's going to run you about 40 bones or so, but it's definitely worth it. So yeah. Now, uh, falling into the number two spot for the Super Nintendo games that I just absolutely love and adore the most is The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Now this is actually the first Legend of Zelda title that I ever played as a kid so it's always gonna hold a special place in my heart for that reason but this game was just absolutely amazing guys. I got a Super Nintendo bundle when I was a kid that uh, came with Donkey Kong but this is one of the, like the next games that my parents got for me and I just absolutely love it. So that's why it landed the number two spot for the games that I love the most for the Super Nintendo. Now the last one here, if you guys are recurring uh, fans of the channel, you'll know that I did a review on this game right around Halloween time. But my number one spot for the game that I just love the most for the Super Nintendo was Demon's Crest. Now if you guys haven't played this one, you better buckle up your seatbelts because it's really difficult as well. Um, it's an action platformer and you take the role of Firebrand here on the front cover. A demon who is trying to recover all of the crests that were wrongfully stolen from him uh, in the opening cutscenes of the game. But yeah guys, it's just truly amazing. It is really difficult and uh, it's super fun. And throughout the game when you collect the crests, you actually earn power-ups and different moves. You can transform your demon into different forms. So it's just really sick. And that is why it stole the number one spot for my favorite Super Nintendo title that I absolutely love the most. I have played that game so much, man. And uh, when I think of the Super Nintendo and my childhood memories, it always goes back to Demon's Crest. So there you have it, guys. That is my top three games that I absolutely love the most for the Super Nintendo and I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Now if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming signing off. Yeah!
What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I have something super special to show you guys. This has been an amazing month for me, and the other day I came across something truly amazing, and today I'm going to be showcasing and uh, giving you guys a little bit of information about my super rare Donkey Kong Nintendo 64 controller with sleeve. So if you guys like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado guys, let's get right into it. Guys, I am super excited to be showing you this awesome Donkey Kong Nintendo 64 controller that I picked up today. This thing is super rare and it's without a doubt one of the most rare things that I have in my collection and uh, I was so happy to find it guys. I've been searching for this bugger for quite a long time now and I actually picked it up off of a, a Facebook group that I'm in. It's called the Nintendo 64 Super Group and it, it's truly remarkable guys. It's amazing. Everybody in there is really awesome, and uh, they post things for sale sometimes. It's also a place just to kind of share your collection and uh, meet like-minded people, but I ran into this on there, and it just so happened to be in Greensburg, Indiana, which is just a little bit east from me, and it's about 30 minutes or so, so you know I couldn't pass it up. But this thing is truly remarkable. Um... The color on it is the standard yellow for the regular Nintendo 64 controllers, but this one is a Donkey Kong inspired controller and it has the red uh, DK64 right underneath the Nintendo engraving here on the top. It has this uh, brown airbrushing on the bottom that makes the controller look like a banana because obviously that's Donkey Kong's favorite food. but. That is just so cool. It's such a nice touch. And if this thing wasn't collectible, I think I would play with it every single day. Um, the stick is in superb condition on this one, which is a common fault with these. But this one is great. And it's pretty impeccable that I found this and I got a really reasonable deal on it. I ended up getting um, the entire controller and the sleeve bundle for $180. And for you collectors out there, you already know, this controller sells uh, anywhere between 80 to about 150 bucks. You'll see it out in the wild for uh, somewhere in between there. So, But the sleeve is honestly almost more obscure and rare than the controller. This thing, uh, it's a cloth, and the stitching in here, I could definitely tell how that would degrade pretty rapidly if you used it quite frequently. So finding this thing in good condition was a feat all in its own. But yeah guys, the controller is super sweet. Um, it was a Nintendo Power exclusive item and it was called the Jungle Pack. And what you would do is you would send Nintendo Power 40 bucks. <laughs> and it was a hell of a deal guys. You would get this awesome controller, you would also get the sleeve, you would get the Donkey Kong 64 strategy guide and a 12 month subscription to Nintendo Power. So it was just a superb deal all around and I would have loved to have uh, got that issue when I was a kid and been able to take advantage of this super sweet deal. But yeah guys, there's my super rare Donkey Kong 64 controller and I'm just so happy to have added it to collection guys. I can't tell you how much. I almost cried to be honest. It was a uh, lifelong goal for sure. I've been looking for a long time. But that's it. If you guys like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching and checking out my uh, awesome controller here, and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Yeah! Boom!
What is going on Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today we're going to be going over all of the amazing pickups that I got in the month of January. So be sure to stay tuned to the end of the video because I've got some amazing stuff guys and you are not going to want to miss it. Now if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. guys let's go ahead and get started here so I got some amazing stuff in the month of January um, one of the most notable games that I got I'm most excited about is the Legend of Zelda a link between worlds for the 3ds now as uh, most of you know the lovely Laura got me these awesome Zelda 3ds is for Christmas that you can see behind me in the backdrop here and um, I've really been wanting a new Zelda game to try to play on them so I had to pick this guy up and I've been having so much fun with it I've been playing it a lot of my downtime, just chilling on the couch and whatnot. But yeah, it's a super good game. I was so happy to pick it up, and I'm one step closer to completing my Legend of Zelda collection. So, minty boys. Now, the next game that I got was one that I've been hunting down for a very long time, and I was super happy to find it. I actually got this at the uh, exchange on East Washington Street. And that is Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic for the original Xbox. Now I got the Platinum Hits Edition here. I'm still wanting to track down the original copy. But uh, this is awesome, guys. We've got the disc. It actually came with the old mail-in stuff. It uh, looks like a mail-in survey. And I just, I love that. I think any game literature that comes in the case is awesome. And I was super happy to find it. Now, the next game that I got was uh, one that I've been looking for for a long time, too, and I believe I got this the exact same day at the exchange, and that was Fable 2. Now, this marks all three games in the Fable catalog for me, guys. Uh, I was super happy to find it, and I, I can't wait to delve into it and play it again. If you guys aren't familiar with the Fable series, you definitely need to check them out because they are super fun. Now, um... Some of the next things that I got here, they came in a lot that I found off of uh, Facebook. So I traveled down to Columbus at what seems to be, it was probably like 12 or 1 o'clock or something. It was super late. But I stumbled upon an amazing deal and I picked up a lot of solid stuff. Now, um, first thing I'm going to show you here is this old Nintendo case. Now, it's not in the best condition, guys. The uh, handle here at the top has been removed, lost throughout the years, unfortunately. But uh, other than that, we just got a couple scrapes on the corners and whatnot. Pretty normal wear and tear. A little rust on the Nintendo, which I actually think is kind of cool. Um, it's just like the historicalness of it, you know what I'm saying? It's been around long enough to rust, so it's pretty neat. But that's not all. When uh, I open that sucker up, it was full of uh, NES games. I got a couple heavy hitters like Metal Gear. Now, uh, a lot of Metal Gear Solid fans are up in the air with this one because Hideo Kojima literally had nothing to do with it and they kind of did it uh, without his knowledge. So at the end of this game, you actually don't even ever fight Metal Gear. You fight like a supercomputer. They changed it in this one which is different than the M MSX-13. But yeah, I got that. Um, we found a Metroid in there. I was super excited about that, guys. I already had one in my collection, so um, I swapped out the better copy. But yeah, I'm sure you guys have played Metroid by now, and if not, you definitely need to. We have the old school Tetris, the OG, and uh, it's actually pretty interesting, guys. 
I have a convention coming up in May called the TORG Gaming Expo, and they are having a Tetris competition there to see um, who gets to represent the Midwest in the national championship for Tetris. So I thought that was pretty cool, and uh, I was super happy to have this. Got to get some practice in. I don't know if I'll win, but it's worth a shot. I found this very obscure game in there called Mystery Quest. And if you guys haven't played this, um, I suggest at least looking up a YouTube video on it. It's pretty out there, man. It's like a platformer, but uh, you run around and shoot lasers out of your hand. You're the guy on the cover here, and the art style is absolutely horrendous, but it's definitely worth popping in and getting a laugh with your friends. We have Top Gun here, solid, uh, solid movie game title. We have Track and Field 2, the, the sequel to Track and Field and Stadium Events, guys. This is uh, pretty awesome stuff, and it is power pad compatible. My friend Jeremiah and I had a great time playing it. The next game we have here is uh, Codename Viper. Now, I'm going to let you know, guys, the graphics on this game are actually stunning. This is one of the uh, better pixel art games that I've seen on the NES, and it's, it's a pretty difficult game, but other than that, it's got some innovative mechanics, and it was actually really neat. So uh, if you guys ever have time, check it out. The, one of the last ones we have in here is a sports title called Double Dribble. I'm sure you guys know what's up with that. It's a basketball game. <laughs> this was a funny title that I found in here as well. Uh, this is called Bump and Jump. <laughs> it's not really obscure. It's like a $3 game. But uh, I thought it was really cool that it had the Movie Time VCR Complete Center, like the label here. Like it was uh, at a movie store at one time for rent or something. So I thought that was super interesting. I like that. Some people hate uh, when there's stickers on games. I'm kind of impartial to it. Uh, I can see the pros and the cons of it, but it kind of adds to the history. You know what I'm saying? Some of those old Blockbuster stickers on those games, everybody hates them, but Blockbuster isn't around anymore either. So it's kind of neat to find those every once in a while, you know? But uh, as for those NES games, guys, that's about it. Now, I found uh, some Atari games in there as well. We've got Barnstorming here. It's a pretty noteworthy title. I looked up a video on it. It's pretty interesting. We've got Super Breakout for the Atari as well. We have Atlantis. Now, I'm not sure what this is about. I haven't looked up anything on it yet, but um, it's so basic on the cover. I don't really know if I'm going to take the time to. I think I'm going to sell all of these games, along with Oink here, at the up-and-coming um, TORG Expo that we're going to be attending. So, yeah. But I also got an entire stack of loose games here from the guy. There's a couple noteworthy titles in here, actually, and um, I actually got a bunch of game sleeves, and I'm planning on probably selling most of these at the convention as well. Um, a lot of them don't have boxes, and it was a funny thing. He actually told me that a lot of the games were complete in box, but when I got there, they were in, like, DVD and Blu-ray cases, so that was something. <laughs> but I actually... Got two Nesses in the same lot as well. Um, both of them work, which was astounding to me. Neither one of them need the uh, toaster repair here, so that was great. I got one Super Nintendo in the lot, which it needs some cleaning, but that's okay, guys. We're going to go ahead and uh, scrub that up and probably sell it at the convention as well. So I'm super excited for but, yeah, that pretty much wraps it up for the lot, guys. Um, I paid 
I think I paid $80 for it, so it wasn't too bad. I felt comfortable paying that for sure, especially since it came with two NESs and the Super Nintendo plus all the games. But yeah, it was a fantastic find and I was really happy to get it. Now, the last thing that I'm going to show you here is something that I am truly excited about. Um, I had been looking for a way to play the Fable games that I got in uh, December and uh, January and the Knights of the Old Republic as well, and I didn't have any means to do it. So I was hunting down an Xbox for a long time. So I ended up uh, finding an Xbox 360 so I could play those games and enjoy them again. But the kicker is on the Facebook Marketplace a couple days later, I found this awesome Gears of War Xbox 360 case. Now guys, this thing is sick. Um, I actually think that I saw this on a Metal Jesus Rocks video once and wasn't sure what it was. At the time, I thought it was a special edition. But here's the kicker with this, guys. Go ahead and sit that down. This cog on the side, when connected to a power source, which is usually the USB in the back of the Xbox, that sucker lights up. How cool is that, guys? I was so happy to find this. I actually found that on the uh, Facebook Marketplace as well from a really cool cat named Dustin. I was super happy to meet him. And uh, yeah, that was a really cool thing to add to the collection. And I got the Xbox and then I found that thing and it all just happened at once and I felt like it was meant to be in a way. It was so awesome. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't help adding it to the collection. It actually came with the box as well, so that's really cool. But yeah, guys, that is the pickups that I got in the month of January. Now, I got some super solid stuff and I was really happy to be able to come and share it with you guys today. Now, if you like what you saw here... Be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Yeah! What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I'm going to be sharing with you guys a couple of events that I have coming up here in the next few months, and I am super excited to be sharing this with you guys. Now, uh, if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. guys so not wasting any time here next month on april 10th through the 12th we've got indianapolis comic-con and i am excited to announce that your boy here got accepted to host his very own panel talking about retro video game collecting in the indianapolis area now the title of the panel is actually called the art of video game collecting in the indianapolis area with outlaw bits gaming crew and i'm very excited about that guys we actually have two days that we're hosting the panel, so be sure to stop in and see us. The first date is Friday from uh, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. in room 135 there in the convention center downtown. But I'm just super stoked about that, guys. And then we actually have the second date as well on Sunday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. in room 131 of the convention center. So be sure to stop and take a load off with us, guys. It's going to be super interesting. We're going to talk about pretty much just video game collecting here in Indy. And towards the end, we're going to have a live Q&A. So it's going to be super sick. 
and uh, I couldn't be more happy to do it. It's going to be great, guys. Now, the next event that we have going on is a month past that, and on May 30th, we are traveling to Ohio for the TORG Retro Gaming Expo. Now, I'm super excited to do this, guys. It's put on by the uh, Canned Air Podcast, and they have been gracious enough to hook Outlaw Bit Standing up with a table. So, we are going to definitely be there, and I want to see you guys there, too. It is awesome. It is at the Lewis Center, Ohio, and it's about three and a half hours away from Indianapolis or so. Not that far, guys, for an awesome retro video game convention. So you guys got to stop by and you got to come and see us. I'm actually going to be setting up a booth and we're going to be selling um, a plethora of amazing video games that I've been collecting here in Indy the past couple months. I've got a couple awesome lots that I'm bringing down there. Going to set up shop and see what we can do. But yeah, guys, so that's pretty much the amazing news I have. That's the two events that we have coming up here in the next couple months. And uh, I hope to see you guys out there. It's going to be really awesome talking with y'all. Can't wait to do it. But if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and I really hope to see you guys at the conventions. And this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Yeah! What is going on guys? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming and I thought I'd come to you this week to kind of give you a little bit of an update in spite of everything that's going on in the country about some of the events that I had posted in my video last week. So if you like what you see here guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado y'all, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so for you returning fans of the channel, I know you caught my uh, video last week talking about all of the upcoming events that I had here in April and May of this year. And it is very unfortunate that I had to come to you today and give you this update despite everything that's going on. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there's kind of an epidemic in the country right now with the coronavirus. So a lot of major things are getting shut down. We've lost the NBA. Uh, as you know, E3 has already gotten canceled and it's starting to move on to a lot of the smaller conventions and things like that for public uh, health and safety reasons. So it's a shame, but Comic-Con on uh, April 10th through the 12th has actually been postponed, guys. And the date is yet to be revealed. I'm sure they're going to tell us after all this stuff blows over and, you know, they kind of feel it out for a bit. Once we kind of get a grip on this thing, we'll know more. But I just wanted to give you guys an update. Um, as of right now, the TORG Expo in Ohio on May 30th is still on. And I think that uh, they're just kind of trying to wait to test the waters too to see if this thing blows over or not before they announce that they're closing. But um, yeah, guys, I'm really excited that that's still happening. And I hope all this nonsense blows over by then and we figure this stuff out. But we got to play it safe, guys. That's one thing that's for sure. We don't want this thing spreading and we don't want it getting worse than it has to be. So we got to do our due diligence and uh, respect what's going on. No, it sucks. And I really was looking forward to doing the panels, but It'll get rescheduled, we'll do them some other time, and it's going to be great, guys. So, yeah. Now, if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted.
What is going on, Outlaws? It's your boy, Kerr Stevens, here with Outlaw Bits Gaming. And today, we're going to be going over all of the games that I picked up in the month of February. Now, I got some real bangers this month, guys, so be sure to stick through to the end of the video to see all the awesome stuff that we picked up. Now, if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so let's get right into it here. I picked up some awesome stuff here in the month of February. Uh, got quite a bit. First stuff I'm going to showcase here is the old Atari 2600. This was uh, donated by my buddy Kyle. Very awesome stuff. He always donates stuff to the channel and I really appreciate it. In that same bundle, he also gave us this awesome PS3. I actually uh, don't have one of these in my collection yet. And oh my god, I forgot how heavy these things were. Uh, that thing is like 40 pounds. But I'm super excited to pick up some titles for that too. Um, he gave me a plethora of heavy hitters. Just a, a lot of good games. Too many to list, honestly. And uh, yeah, I was super excited about that, guys. I didn't have an Atari 2600 yet, and I definitely didn't have a PlayStation 3 anymore. I sold mine back in the day to get the PS4, I believe. So yeah, super stoked. Now, the next thing that I'm going to show you here, if you saw uh, the video at the beginning of the month, the week after I picked up this sucker, this is a holy grail item. This is one of the uh, coolest items in my collection, honestly, and I was super excited to travel down to Greensburg, Indiana to pick it up. But that is my Donkey Kong 64 Limited edition Nintendo Power uh, controller with this beautiful banana sleeve, guys. I'm just absolutely in love with it. It's one of the coolest parts of my collection, and uh, I'm just so happy to have it. I can't express it enough. Seems like we're joined by the Outlaw Bits Kitty. She's jumped in behind my chair here. But um, the next two pickups were something that I got at uh, the Disc Replay on the east side of Indianapolis, one of my favorite go-to joints. And that was StarCraft 64. Now, if you saw my rarest uh, Nintendo 64 games video, you'll know that this sucker is on it. It is one of the hardest games to obtain. Um, just very limited number, and it had mixed audience reviews. A lot of people didn't like StarCraft. They'd rather play it on the PC. They didn't like the uh, incorporation of the Nintendo 64 controller. Just didn't feel right to them. I still think it's pretty cool, but uh, I was super excited to pick it up and add it to the collection. So yeah. Now the next game I snagged from there was a have to. I've been wanting to start collecting the uh, Blood Omen series, and I figure none better to start than the Legacy of Kane for the original PlayStation 1 here. It's really awesome. It's made by Crystal Dynamics. You see a little Gex in the corner there. Pretty dope. But yeah, guys. Super excited to bust this out, get the old PS1 going, and uh, give her a try. It's been years since I've played this game. Speaking of PS1s, my buddy Kyle also gave me this awesome PlayStation 1. Um, I have a couple of these, actually, that I'm going to be selling when I do the TORG Retro Gaming Expo. But the one that I usually rock when I play games is my Slim. But... I was super happy to have another one in the collection, and I think I'm going to keep that one because it's in super good condition. Sell the others, but yeah. Now, the last thing that I want to show you guys that I am most excited about that I picked up in the month of February is this awesome R2-D2 Xbox 360. The outer shell looks like R2-D2, guys. This is a really freaking awesome piece. It makes R2-D2 noises. And when you press the power button, 
it illuminates a beautiful shade of blue instead of that standard Xbox green. I was super excited to find it. Um, I actually got wind of it on the Facebook Marketplace and I traveled up to the west side, met a cat up there, and snagged it for 40 bucks. Came with that, the Connect, and what I'm honestly most excited about is this C3PO Golden Controller. These are very difficult to all find in a set, and I was super excited to do so, guys. This thing is so clean. Um, I will be honest with you, it harbors uh, fingerprints really easily, but it is a super awesome piece, and ever since I've got it, I've been playing with this sucker every single day. Been playing Knights of the Old Republic, and what fitting of a better controller than the C3PO controller. It's got these awesome wires on the underside here, kind of illustrate the... Uh, electronic portion of C3PO and it's got this beautiful gold shell. So yeah, I was super stoked to get it guys. Couldn't be happier. But there we have it y'all. I hope you guys enjoyed my pickups for the month of February and I was super excited to show you guys all the amazing stuff that I found this month. So if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and this has been Kerr Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Yeah! Woo! Let's get it, boys. What is going on Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming and today I'm going to be doing a review of Animal Crossing New Horizons. Now if you guys haven't checked this out yet I highly suggest it. I have been playing the hell out of it and if you like what you see here today click the links below to like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well without any further ado guys let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so Animal Crossing New Horizons. Let me tell you, Laura and I have been playing this game pretty much every second that we could since it came out and we are absolutely in love with it. It brings back everything from those old Animal Crossing games that you know and love and it also adds a new spin and a new twist in that uh, this one takes place on an island. So basically, you uh, go to this island for a vacation and some way or another, Mr. Tom Nook persuades you into becoming a full-time resident. And from there on in, you basically live your entire life in his complete and total servitude. Your main goal after that point is to run around the island and do everything that you can to acquire bells so that you can pay Tom Nook off uh, for all of the upgrades that he does on your home. And let me tell you, man, he does some awesome upgrades. I'm actually only on the uh, third one now. Yeah, I'm on the third one right now and it is pretty cool. They are just adding some amazing new features to this game and you guys are not going to want to miss it. If you haven't picked it up yet, I highly suggest getting it. They just added so many cool things. So it takes place on an island and a new spin that they put on this Animal Crossing is that they made it uh, multiplayer. So basically everybody has an airport in their town. And you'll get to a certain point in the game where you can go to the airport, you can talk to the awesome, awesome dodo bird that runs the counter there, and he will open the gates to your island. Now, my island's called The Grove, and uh, I've had a couple buddies stop by and play, and it was super fun, guys. I've always wanted to play Animal Crossing with other people, and it's a dream come true, to be honest. It makes it super easy to share items and to help your buddies out and that is honestly the greatest part about it to me um 
Back in the day, you actually had to take your memory card from your GameCube over to your buddy's house, and you had to make your character go to his, uh, his town. You would have to harvest fruit from his town, take them back to your town and plant them, do the whole jazz. But now with this awesome multiplayer, up to eight people can come to your village, and each one of them can bring something new. They can drop you furniture, they can drop you fruit, and it's just really beneficial in that way. So you all can kind of work together as a community and help each other out. Maybe one friend needs some clumps of uh, weeds, one friend over here needs some orange tulips. So it's a great way to come together, and Nintendo did an awesome job implementing the multiplayer. There's a couple features about it that are um, a little odd. I hope that they pan them out here in the future. So like for instance, when you have some buddies come to your island, while they're there, you actually lose the ability to drop furniture onto the ground um, as far as to display it like in your home. And you also lose the ability to change your uh, flooring and your wallpaper. Now, I honestly think that this is just new for Nintendo. So they're going to probably fix it with a patch soon because that is a big hindrance. Honestly, if you guys are playing together for hours, you still need to be able to drop furniture in your home and change your background to keep the game flowing, I feel like. It gets a little stagnant and uh, you kind of get to the point sometimes where you want your buddy to leave so you can check out your new furniture and kind of progress in the game in that way. But other than that, the multiplayer system is amazing and I highly recommend it, guys. There's just a lot of super awesome features to this. Another thing that I thought was super cool about this game is that you can actually like cross fertilize flowers in order to make new colors. So let's say for instance you want pink tulips. What you would do is you would put red tulips in the center, white tulips in a cross pattern around it, and then in every area that was blank um, it will actually fertilize and start to grow new pink colored tulips in the spaces around it. I thought that was super awesome guys and it just adds another level of complexity to the game. It's super neat. But yeah, we've pretty much just been running around trying to stack those bells and pay off Mr. Nook. Uh, they implemented a lot of awesome, a lot of awesome construction qualities for your island in general. So there's a few places in your island that you can only access with a tool that you get a couple hours into the game called a ladder. And basically it's just, you know, like a higher peninsula, raised level of land. Well, eventually you'll get the opportunity to go to the community center and to pay for construction um, projects to go on. And you can add an awesome ramp to alleviate the constant switching to your ladder to get up those slopes. Uh, you can fabricate bridges that make it easier to run about your town and collect or connect uh, land masses. So I thought that was super awesome, guys. And they just really stepped up their game with the home decor stuff. The decorations and the way that you can uh, pimp out your island are just truly impeccable. They have a lot of outside exterior furniture as well as interior furniture which was another new thing that I thought was awesome. You can actually decorate the outside of your house and make it feel more like your home. Whereas in old, uh, older Animal Crossing titles, you basically just had your house, you had your mailbox, and that was it. You could throw some flowers around it, you were pretty much done. They also implemented uh, fencing into this kind of pimp your yards out a little more, which I thought was an amazing thing to add as well. But yeah, guys, it's a super solid game. Uh, bells are pretty easy to come by. If you've ever played any Animal Crossing before, you know just to stick to your normal things. Go around and collect as many shells as you can. Go around and collect all foreign fruit because every fruit that isn't um, native to your island is worth $500 a piece. So you could potentially get like an entire orchard growing of different fruit and stack those bells, my friends. Um, other than that, everything is amazing, guys. The bug catching mechanics are awesome. If you guys haven't ran into any tarantulas yet, look out. It's coming. They're going to push you on your tail. They bite you and you faint. But I thought that was really neat as well. 
Better catch those suckers, though, because they are $8,000 a piece. Something you definitely want to look out for while you're playing, guys. But yeah, the graphics are really smooth. Everything works well. I haven't had many problems with the online. Uh, one of my friends was having a connectivity issue, I believe, on his end. And that is the only issue that I've had with it thus far. But yeah, pretty freaking awesome, guys. Spectacular. But that pretty much wraps it up. I think it's a great game, and I'm ready to delve and put a lot more time and effort and hours into it. Probably about 20 hours in right now. I want to get to around the 250 mark, see what my island looks like around that point. But yeah, super awesome game, guys. If you haven't bought it yet, I highly suggest you check it out. Now, you know that we had to get all the pre-order bundles that we could. We uh, got a few copies of the game, actually. We got some from Best Buy, and when you pre-ordered it from there, you got this awesome bell bag. It is actually usable, and you can fill it with goodies. Pretty sweet stuff. And then the Target exclusive pre-order bonus that we got, Laura and I both got one of these as well, was the Animal Crossing Journal. Now, I kept mine sealed, but she opened hers up to use it, and it is super cool, guys. There's a, actually a calendar in here as well, and it's just a really awesome Animal Crossing themed journal. And if you know uh, from the old Animal Crossing games, like the first thing you always got in your house was a little bedside table, like a little rickety shack looking thing. And on that table was always a journal. So I thought that was super cool. We finally have our own Animal Crossing journals. But that was amazing, and I'm really glad that we could get those too. But yeah, guys, if you like what you saw here today, click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and I hope you uh, enjoyed my review of Animal Crossing New Horizons. This has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, y'all. Signing off. Yeah! Yeah! Boom! That's how we do it, boys. What is going on, guys? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming. And today, I wanted to give you guys yet another update on everything that's going on with my events this year based off of uh, the COVID-19 situation. So buckle up your seatbelts, guys. You're going to want to hear this. Got some important news for you. And if you like what you see here today, click those links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring the notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so I know this is actually my second update now, but as things start progressing and uh, this virus keeps getting worse and worse, dates of things keep getting pushed back. So um, I just wanted to come at you today and pretty much let you know that I have some what seem to be definitive dates for Comic-Con and the TORG Expo in Ohio. So Comic-Con guys has been moved to June 26th through the 28th. All of our panel times and everything like that have stayed the exact same, so I'm super happy. But uh, it's honestly a silver lining because it just gave me more time to prepare for it. So I think that the um, panel is going to be amazing, and I cannot wait to share it with you guys. So be sure to join us June 26th through the 28th here at Indianapolis, Indiana Convention Center for Comic-Con 2020, guys. Now, the TORG Expo in Ohio, that has been pushed back to September 5th. I thought that one was going to make it, and uh, since it was at the end of May, it was going to push through, but we got to take all the precautions that we can, guys, and they've decided to push it back to September, and I'm super excited about that as well. Just gives us more opportunities to go and collect some retro games that we can set up at our booth, and uh, gives us more time to promote, so it's freaking awesome. But yeah, 
that's been my little update here, guys. I was super excited to be able to bring it to you. I know it's a bummer that keep, things keep getting pushed back, but it's all right. We just got to work together. We got to stay safe during this time of crisis, and we'll pull through it, y'all. So if you like what you saw here today, be sure to click those links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. I can't thank you guys enough for watching, and I hope to see you guys at all the events that we have coming up here. And this has been Kurt Stevens, your number one outlaw with Outlaw Bits Gaming, signing off. Yeah! That's how we do it. What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today... I'm going to be doing my review of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Now, if you like what you see here today, guys, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Oh my god, where to start? This game is such a nostalgia bomb, guys. Final Fantasy VII was one of my all-time favorite games on the PlayStation, and uh, actually my cousin William and I beat the game together as a kid. So I have a lot of really fond memories with the game, and I was so excited when they announced they were doing this remake. I know we've been waiting for it for quite some time, but they did not disappoint, guys. Square came hard with this one, and uh, I just absolutely love it. The graphics on this game are stunning. The visual displays and the cinematics are almost seamless with the actual gameplay. It just flows so well, and uh, I love, I love, love, love the town of Midgar. I'm about seven or eight hours in, I'd say right now, and I've been uh, exploring Midgar as much as possible. I've been on the hunt for Easter eggs and things like that while I've been playing. But uh, yeah, guys, the game is so great. The mechanics of the combat, um, they're actually really amazing. I know I was a huge fan of the turn base, and a lot of other people are that way too. But the way that they did a lot of these um, more recent Final Fantasy games, like Final Fantasy XV, for instance, uh, it's really nicely done. And I feel like they moved it over flawlessly to Final Fantasy VII Remake as well. They took out like the jump function and the warp function that Noctis could do on Final Fantasy XV, because obviously Cloud wasn't running around doing that sort of stuff. But uh, it's really cool. I like the... Um, abilities that you can use you start out with some heavy hitters like braver and cross slash super awesome your limit breakers work a little bit different on this uh, you have it pretty much as soon as you start the game you had to progress to a certain level on the old one before you got like your awesome limit breakers but yeah uh super super great guys the story, they've changed it up in more ways than one, but honestly, I haven't found one thing that I was upset with yet. It is just, it's awesome. It's really nice to put faces to some of these old characters that you really couldn't get the uh, full experience with back in the PlayStation days. The graphic capabilities and everything like that, but like Jesse and Biggs and Wedge, I finally have faces to associate with those characters and it just, honestly, it makes me connect to them so much more. But yeah, they look stunning. Um, the dynamic of all of the people in Avalanche, I thought was really nicely done. You can tell they're actually like a tight-knit group of a family. That's super cool. But if you're expecting to use this Final Fantasy VII strategy guide from back in the day, guys, you might as well throw that sucker out the window. Um, they've changed a lot. <laughs> it starts to be linear at the beginning, but I feel like as the game progresses, it opens up more. And that was something I was really, really excited about. 
I love the weapon customization on this one. Uh, you get SP skill points and you can actually pick different skills and different perks associated with each one of your weapons. Thought that was really nicely done as well. Some other Final Fantasy games in the past have done that, but they executed it really, really, really well with this Final Fantasy VII remake. I'm just fangirling so hard, guys. I'm having such a great time with it. Honestly, I can't even wait to hop back on my PlayStation and get to it later on this evening. I'm definitely going to be streaming for sure in the days to come. Now, I know that some of you are aware that uh, the game is going to be released in sort of episodes. You're not going to get the whole thing at once. That was kind of a bummer for me. Um, I would have even actually rather them taken more time on it to release the entire game at once. Because I'm scared what they're going to do is make us buy a season pass or even buy the next episode of the game individually every single time. And I already spent 70 bucks on it. I don't want to keep throwing money at the thing, you know. We'll see what they do with that, though. Um, still up in the air, and nothing's been set in stone yet, so we're just going to have to wait and see, guys. But yeah, all in all, I thought the game was amazing, and if you haven't picked it up yet, you have to go get it. Uh, this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and if you like what you saw here, guys, click that link below to like and subscribe. And uh, be sure to stay tuned for amazing retro video game content. I can't thank you guys enough for watching my review of Final Fantasy VII here. And uh, yeah, this has been Kurt Stevens again, signing off. Let's get it, y'all. You. Yeah. What is going on, Outlaws? It's Kurt Stevens here again with Outlaw Bits Gaming, and today I wanted to try something a little bit new for you guys. Um, as you know, I've been playing a lot of the Final Fantasy VII Remake that came out, and I wanted to do an instructional video this week on how to beat the holy hell out of the Materia boss, Shiva. Now, she is something else, guys. She's pretty difficult, so uh, buckle up your seatbelts, and if you like what you see here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. Well, without any further ado, guys, let's get right into it. Alrighty guys, so the first thing you're going to want to do is open up the menu and you're going to select your weapon. I went with the good old Buster Sword, always a solid choice. Then you're going to come down here to your Materia, and Shiva is the god of ice, so you are going to need to equip the fire Materia for sure. You got to do a lot of damage on her, and that is how you're going to do it. The next important part is to make sure that you have the elemental materia equipped and linked with fire because you need your weapons endowed with the power of fire. After that, you're going to equip a healing materia. And as far as the other two, that's really up to you guys. I went with the luck materia and the assess materia. Always good ones to have on your person. And after that, you're just going to prepare for the battle, guys. Now I have a lot of solid choices here to choose from. You're going to go over to your man, Mr. Chadley, here, and you're going to talk to him. Open up the VR missions, and you're going to select Miss Shiva. He's going to give you these awesome portable battle simulator glasses, and you're going to get straight into the action, guys. It heats up pretty intense. She is a very worthy adversary, and your main goal here is to last until you can get your summon. So what you're going to do is you're just going to attack and you're going to dodge as much as possible. Use your Fyra magic. And what that's going to do is it's going to stagger her for a bit. And it's going to give you uh, some time to unleash some devastating blows. Really knock that damage into her. Just keep on using it, guys. Um, when she first gets up, she can't be staggered again. So you're going to need to watch out for that. But give her some time. Get that... 
AP up and then you'll be able to use it again and stagger her down. She unleashes devastating blows and you guys are going to want to watch out for them for sure. They are hard to dodge, but once you uh, get her timing figured out, they are easy as pie. There we have it. She is staggered, guys. Now, what you want to do is switch to Punisher mode and just unleash hell right now. You are really chopping away at that HP, and it shows, guys. She is feeling it. Be sure to uh, stock up on ethers. Before you do this battle, you're going to need them. Using a lot of MP here. I believe it takes 10 every time you use Fyra. So, you're going to need some MP, guys. Now, watch that health. If it gets low, you are going to definitely need to use that cure. Until you have finally achieved the summon. Our summon bar is full. And we are ready to get it popping, guys. You got to heal up here. Get your bar ready one more time. And you are ready to unleash Ifrit. Now, this is the perfect summon to use in this circumstance. He is a fire demon, and he unleashes devastating damage upon her. So just keep attacking, dodging, and staying steadfast. Build up your gauge and unleash Ifrit's amazing fire attacks upon her. We've got Crimson Dive, and uh, that one works super well. We've also got the Radiant Plume, which does the most damage, but it takes two bars. We're just going to keep chopping away at her, guys. Building up that ATB. Super effective. If you guys stick to this plan, you will have her beat in no time, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to feel so amazing after it's done. She is tough. And if you beat her, guys, you earned it, let me tell you. Keep an eye on your health. Ifrit should keep her pretty stunned most of the time if his attacks keep landing in a timely manner. And as you can see, we have almost got her beaten here. She is trying everything she can, unleashing special attacks. And there's nothing you can do to dodge this, so you just got to make sure you have enough health, guys. Always a good move. Anyways, use that Cura as much as possible. And as you can see, even with Ifrit and all the fire materia, this is no easy task. Pull out everything you can in order to survive. We just had to use a high potion here. And Ifrit is leaving the building, and he is going to do his ultimate attack on the way out. And that is going to seal the deal, guys. That is a hell of a way to end it. If you follow these strategies, you are going to do fantastic. I can't thank you guys enough for watching. This is the first time I've ever tried a video like this, and uh, I appreciate all and any feedback that you're willing to give. So drop down in that comment section and let us know what's going on. If you like what you saw here today, be sure to click the links below to like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all of Outlaw Bits videos as soon as they're posted. This has been my how-to on how to destroy Shiva and to unlock her as a materia in the Final Fantasy VII Remake. And this has been Kurt Stevens with Outlaw Bits Gaming, guys, signing off. I gotta give a special shout out to Indianapolis Crown Jewel Incorporated for doing an amazing job on this gold grill. Go check them out today, guys. 38th Street in Emerson, Indianapolis, Indiana. Let's get it.